I'd like to thank um, the Royal Met Center for inviting me to be part of this uh, very exciting event talking about um, machine learning in operational meteorology. So um, in this talk, I'm going to be talking about how we apply specifically machine learning at the Met Office. Um, I'm going to try and set to the scene at a fairly top level and hopefully pave the way for the other speakers that we've got on the agenda today, who, some of whom I think will be able to fill in some of the detail that I'm not going to have time to cover in this presentation. Right, let's see if we can make this move forward. So the um, backdrop for this talk and indeed for our daily lives is that we are in the midst of a revolution in artificial intelligence where the world's fastest growing deep technology has the potential to rewrite the rules of entire industries, fundamentally changing the way that we work and live. Advances in data science, including machine learning and artificial intelligence, mean that computers can now analyze and learn from vast volumes of information and data at high levels of accuracy and speed, offering significant gains in efficiency and performance to most sectors, including the weather science sector. And to take advantage of these technological breakthroughs, many scientific disciplines are revising their operating plans and that includes the work of the UK Met Office, where we are having a look at how we might embrace this new technology into our operational workflows. So um, also on this slide, I wanted to say that I'm, I'm going to have, there's too much ground to cover in the time that I've been allocated. So I've tried to put some references throughout this presentation in case you want to find a wee bit more information. So on this first slide, you'll see at the bottom, um, the green box that has references if you want to find out a little bit more um, detail about anything that we're covering today. So in order to um, provide a framework that um, supports the use of artificial intelligence by everyone in the Met Office, we split um, the Met Office staff into three personas. First of all, there's an AI user. And that is literally anybody in the building. Um, this is AI as part of our everyday lives. Um, even before you get to work, AI has probably touched your life at least half a dozen times from um, when you ask um, Alexa what the weather's going to be like that day or when you um, turn off the alarm on your mobile phone using face recognition or when you use Google Maps to get to find the route, the quickest route to work without traffic. So it's part of our daily life. So AI users are literally everybody, everyone who comes through the door of the Met Office is an AI user. Then we have application developers and these staff are likely to be working in research or maybe the technology teams. And they'll be developing and delivering what we call national capability. And I'll come on to that in a minute. And they use things such as the GitHub co-pilots. And then there's a slightly smaller cohort. These are data scientists. And these again sit within the research and technology teams. And these are like these staff are likely to be using machine learning code um, to build tools. So they'll be doing the hard wiring of um, developing AI approaches in the Met Office. So we take those three personas and we map them across the three domains within the Met Office. So the three domains are national capability, which is the bedrock science and technology research, products and services, which use national capability to deliver impact and value, and then enabling, which is the support functions that keeps the cogs moving in the machine of the Met Office. And that includes um, capabilities such as IT services, security, HR, finance, so all of the functions that are essential to the smooth running of the Met Office. So we have this overarching framework, AI for everyone. It maps AI into those three activities using the personas. And then within each of those three domains, <coughs> we have activities, capabilities, projects, um, products and services that use AI. And I've just put um, one or two on these slides because it was, it's impossible to cover it all. I don't 
hopefully have time, but um, just a couple I thought would be worth mentioning. So we uh, run training events and hackathons for our operational meteorologists, and that maps into AI for products and services. And then with, within AI for enabling, um, we are trialing the use of Copilots, so Microsoft 365 Copilot and GitHub Copilot to um, see if they um, help staff in their day-to-day -day work, increase productivity and <coughs> improve the work experience of the staff in the enabling areas. On this slide, I've also put a link to the Generative AI Framework for Government I thought it was worth highlighting. This was published about, <coughs> about a month ago, I think, and it provides um, a really useful guide for how to use generative AI, so some of the principles for using generative AI in uh, public sector work. But it's a really excellent report. Um, I don't often recommend these government reports, but this one's really rather good. So then within national capability, the one, I want, the one example I wanted to flag was we have a project called AI for Numerical Weather Prediction, AI for NWP. So I'm now going to tell you a little bit more detail about AI for NWP. But to do this, the first thing I need to do is take a step back. Now, I'm sure everybody online and in the room is familiar with this uh, uh, pipeline for how to produce a forecast, this value chain, where um, we're taking observations, feeding them into um, a simulation. We are producing um, through processes and analysis millions of predictions that go out and support products and services from the Met Office. Now, what you probably don't often think about is the amount of data that goes into this value chain. So it is big data throughout. So we have 215 billion observations coming in every day. We run 3 million lines of code in the simulation part. And the weather model produces 18 terabytes of data every single day. So big data is our every, every day at the Met Office. Now, that's really important because when we say, when I said at the beginning that we are in the midst of an AI revolution, that AI revolution has brought with it tools and techniques for operating at scale and for addressing the challenges of big data. So we are really trying to find ways to embrace the AI revolution and to use it to help us with the challenges of big data. And the other reason it's worth revisiting my words from the beginning to say that we're in the midst of a revolution is this has been happening for a while. So all across this uh, value chain, we have examples of where we have been deploying AI and machine learning. And I've put a few images to remind me to talk about specific projects here. So, for example, on the left hand side, some of you may be familiar with the work that um, we did at the Met Office using machine learning to classify expendable bathyothermiographs that are dropped. These are ocean probes. They travel down the water column um, recording uh, the ocean temperature. But it's really essential that you have um, metadata for all of the ocean probes in order to do the bias correction. Sadly, 50% of these ocean probes are lacking metadata. So and we've successfully used machine learning to infill that metadata so that the data um, can have the bias correction. And it's a more reliable, more reliable indicator of how the ocean temperatures have changed. Um, next example. Um, so the one of Socrates, so the one in the middle, the image of Socrates. Here at the Met Office, we've used uh, machine learning to develop a emulator or a surrogate that sits within the weather model um, for radiation. So that's the Socrates scheme. And then on the right hand side of the image, uh, let's choose the wave one. Okay, um, here we have, we've done some work with the um, National Meteorological Service in South Africa using machine learning to um, predict future 
wave climatologies and that's really important in South Africa because the level of exposure and vulnerability of critical national infrastructure on their coastal areas and it's an area of the world that's uh, subject to um, what's called monster waves so it's very important that we can have a look at future wave climatologies and make sure the resilience is built into the critical national infrastructure today. And I also wanted to mention on that one that um, I think we've got to talk coming up later um, about machine learning and oceanography. And there was um, a piece of work, off, I've mentioned it down in the reference list actually. There's a piece of work uh, much closer to home than South Africa. So it was in Cornwall um, looking at uh, ocean wave conditions in, and um, using that information for um, the energy sector, but I think we'll be hearing more on that later. So there was, the general message here is that during the, the um, acceleration and the proliferation of AI tools, we'd kind of started to adopt them in the Met Office. It kind of started to grow up organically. We were doing lots of bits and pieces, but we were approaching the point in about, 2022 where we needed to bring all of these activities together we needed to have a better strategy better framework for how we were going to adopt uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence across the office so in 2022 we developed a data science framework um, i'm going to turn off my um, screen sharing now and i'm hoping that we'll be able to um, watch a video. Okay.
Thank you. I've just read in the comments that I think some of you were spared the um, sound. Um, you can watch this. You can listen to the sound with the video on YouTube. But I should warn you, it's the most awful earworm. You'll never be able to unhear it once you once you've heard the soundtrack. So thank God for small mercies if you if you didn't catch that. So as I said, we um, twenty twenty two started to pull together all the various strands of work that were happening. looking at machine learning and the opportunities across the whole value chain. And um, now you've seen the movie, um, I would encourage um, you to have a look at the, uh, the document that goes behind it. Um, let's have a look. So the um, data science framework is the document that inspires the uh, the animation that you saw. In the data science framework, we split all of the machine learning activities in the office into three pillars, capability, people, and partners. And then within the capabilities one, I want to draw your attention to um, the second capability. So these four capabilities are the areas that were prioritized in 2022 within the Met Office for us to really try and push forward um, areas that we thought would be really essential to the future of building machine learning into um, Met Office business. So the second capability is fusing simulations with data science. So we did that in uh, 2022 and decided on our priorities. And thank goodness we did, because roughly six months later, the whole world changed for the Met Office with respect to machine learning. OK, so on this line, um, the blue line is the timeline. Um, the gray line are publications about machine learning and weather forecasting that um, came out. And the green items are things that had happened at the Met Office. So if you'll see in July 2022, that's when we published the data science framework. And you'll see that it's roughly six months before at the, just at the tail end of 2020 to 23, when it just went crazy. There were a lot of publications that came out, predominantly by big technology companies. So big tech companies like Huawei and Google and DeepMind, they started publishing models of how you could use uh, machine learning to forecast the weather. So just to try and put this in everyone's mind. So it was the tail end of 2020, 2023. 2022, we'd published the data science framework. We'd had six months to feel quite good about having the data science framework. And then all of a sudden, the whole world seemed to change. Um, this was also around about the time that uh, chat GPT um was launched so that was launched in november 2022 so it was quite an interesting christmas that one um it felt like that that everything was changing all at once within the met office um we had because of the data science framework we'd started to um have a look at um the role of machine learning in weather forecasting we'd launched a project which at the time we called the moonshot because Back in 2021, when we launched the project, it felt like a moonshot. However, when everything started changing in 2023, um, I really regretted that we'd called it the moonshot because it's not a moonshot anymore. This is an absolute certainty. Uh, machine learning can be used to forecast the weather. So thankfully, we had the data science framework to fall back on. 
And using that framework, we pulled together some activities related to machine learning and weather forecasting that we could use for uh, um, that we could use to um, accelerate the Moonshot project, and we launched. Um, AI for numerical weather prediction. This is a end-to-end -end machine learning system for global and regional forecasting. The goal of the program was to explore the use of machine learning to emulate the model and produce an ensemble seven-day weather forecast that covers both global and regional scale. That program is made up of four projects um, and those four projects map into two streams. So the four projects are input data sets, which is basically preparing the data that you train your model on. Um, so you train your machine learning model using that data set. Then um, in stream A, um, so that would be input data sets, then the moonshot, which was the moonshot was exploring the use of machine learning for global and UK weather forecasting. And it develops a model that um, at the Met Office um, is called FastNet. Um, the FastNet model has some similarities to the um, AIFS model that I think Matt Chantry is going to tell you about later on today. So I won't go into any more details about that project. And then um, the other project that's in stream A is model agnostic infrastructure. So once you have developed a machine learning model, it's important to be able to embed it in operational workflows. So the model agnostic infrastructure is looking at how do we embed machine learning at the Met Office into our weather forecasting processes. Stream B also use input data sets. Um, and um, um, the second project is called Machine Learning Model Intercomparison. And here we're looking at several other uh, machine learning models, including um, Pangu Weather, um, Graphcast, um, we're looking at AIFS, so looking at other machine learning models to identify how these models perform relative to one another, but also relative to do traditional physics-based and numerical weather prediction. So this is a bit like um, a, a league table, a leaderboard of which models are performing best. And then Based on that, we should be able to take one of these models and again use that, that third project, the model agnostic infrastructure, to make sure that we're embedding um, the most appropriate forecast into our workflows. So then later in 2023, it's been quite a busy couple of years, later in 2023, um, we formed a partnership with the Allen Turing Institute. The Allen Turing Institute is the UK's National Centre for Data Science and AI. Really excited about this partnership because this has enabled us to really accelerate the AI for NWP programme. They have a rich supply of extremely talented data scientists and uh, it's uh, um, our pleasure to work with them on this programme and to um, see what we can do together to develop the FastNet model. So now to looking forward, um, we don't anticipate that the pace of AI and machine learning developments is going to slow. Um, if anything, it feels like it continues to accelerate. But at the Met Office, we're changing too, and we're getting ready to embrace this technology right across our workflows and in our day-to-day -day operations through the AI for Everyone framework. Key activities in the next few months are going to be to develop further the FastNet model, to look at ongoing assessment of the FastNet model performance relative to other machine learning models and critically rel um, relative to um, physics-based numerical weather prediction. We need to prepare for the operational changes that a machine learning model may bring. So how do, we, how do we build machine learning models into our workflows? Um, we are having a look and considering how we use these machine learning models for ensemble forecasts and uncertainty forecasts. And we're continuing to work with partners right across the MET community, but also now the technology communities to make sure that we are doing our best to harness AI for weather forecasting.
So while the overarching goal of the program remains the same, to explore the use of machine learning to emulate models, model and produce an ensemble seven day forecast, although that remains the same, our dynamic, our um, operating environment is very dynamic. And this means that the emphasis for the project and the program is on agility. Um, we have these four projects. We don't anticipate that the four projects will remain just, they won't be the only four projects. They may well change. Um, we need to adapt and respond to the opportunities that artificial intelligence presents us as we go forward. So in summary, we are embracing AI right across the Met Office through the AI for Everyone program. We're working in partnership to accelerate the adoption and develop data-driven approaches. And we are working hard to pave the way for future opportunities. Thank you very much. Brilliant, yeah, great presentation there. Um, so do we have any questions in the room, first of all, for Kirsten? Microphone, Catherine. Any questions at all? Uh, I could, could I ask a quick question, actually, um, if you don't mind? Um, as a weather forecaster and with the sort of introduction of uh, the new supercomputer over the next few years, will sort of these AI models sort of overtake the sort of supercomputer and become the norm? Is that how we sort of see it, perhaps, Kirsten, in the, in the future? And have our, our ideas because of AI changed our way of thinking of of having sort of the supercomputer as such um that's probably my my thought i don't i don't think of it like that i think that no. um the use of ai is um the next step in the evolution of numerical weather prediction it's not a it's not like a cutoff point that you know complete break with everything that you've done before so this is about looking at um the progress that we're making through the next generation modeling system and the development of momentum and how do we weave the uh, the best aspects of machine learning into that model and how okay. do we run machine learning data-driven approaches alongside it so that forecasts become better quicker cheaper more accurate lovely brilliant thank you have we got any questions online at all okay from a, an anonymous attendee in the light of ai forecast being cheaper and seemingly as accurate as nlp does the met office have any compelling reasons for continuing to develop pivot-based models <laughs> um sorry I, I can't hear the questions okay let's try the other microphone if not you can run up here you cheat okay i'll read the question out here uh, with the microphone in the light of ai forecasts being cheaper and seemingly as accurate as nwp does the met office have any compelling reasons for continuing to develop physics-based models um well, there's quite a lot in that question. Mm. <laughs> um, it says seemingly as accurate. Um, I would challenge that to start with. Um, we are looking at machine learning models and um, the decision's not yet made. It's not yet certain um, how they perform against when stacked against physics-based models. So I think it's really important that um, we're, you know, um, have, a, have a look at the two approaches together. Um, my gut feeling is that the um, Optima approach is going to be a blend of the two. Um, it's also important to, and I think perhaps Matt will want to cover this a bit more later, but um, uh, machine learning models are trained and verified using numerical weather prediction models. So you, you kind of need both. <laughs> um, so it's... I. I went to a talk recently um, where um, the creators of the developers of the Pangu model were there, and they said categorically that they do not anticipate um, machine learning models taking the place of numerical weather predictions. So, you know, 
I completely agree with that. Um, I think that it'd be a very interesting few years ahead of us to see how these um, two tracks come together to um, enable us to produce even better, faster, cheaper forecasts. Lovely. And a couple more questions have come in. We've got a few minutes. So is Fastnet a pure statistical machine learning model or is it also or does it also embed information about physics of the atmosphere? Um, well, it's early days for Fastnet. Um, this, at the moment, AI for NWP is a research program. And, um, you know, really, although the world is moving really fast, we've not been running it for very long. Um, the intention is that we will build in um, physics. You know, this is um, this is an area that the Met Office has expertise. So this is something that we're obviously keen to explore. How do we make the best of machine le of the opportunities presented by machine learning models, um, but also um, think about physical constraints and how to, how do we get these models as good as they can possibly be using everything that we've got? So that includes thinking about data science and data driven methods, but also thinking about meteorology. Lovely. And how can we evaluate the machine learning based emulation of physical parameterizations in NWP? Uh, what sort of metrics are acceptable for evaluating the performance? Um, so there's a, these are really great questions. There's um, a whole project that we've got um, developing, looking at um, the measures that we want to put in place for um, evaluating performance, because I think some of the evaluation metrics that the maybe the big tech companies developed when they um, proposed the use of these models, there might not be the same metrics that the MET community would use. So we have a project, it's called um, Machine Learning Model End Comparison. Um, I can't remember which one it was on the diagram, but that project is looking and working very closely with our operational meteorologists to identify what metrics are most important to them, um, even at a UK resolution. <coughs> what information do, that, that is the most important for us to track. Um, I don't think it's going to end up being just one thing. And it might not even just be, it might be a basket of measures that we put in place. And it may well be that those measures change for different conditions. Lovely, brilliant. Thank you very much, Kirsten, for your time this afternoon. That's been um, brilliant. It's been really good. Lovely, thank you. Um, so on to our next presentation uh, is with Jonathan Coney. Uh, he's a PhD student, PhD student in the School of Earth and Environment uh, at the University of Leeds. And he's using machine learning to investigate the prevalence of Lee waves over Britain and Ireland using NWP model data. So over to Jonathan. <laughs> Oh, right, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so, hello, yes, I'm Jonathan Coney. Um, I'm a fan of PhD student at the University of Leeds, panicking and writing up and all those sorts of fun things. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about the work I've been doing as part of that. So, excuse me. Um, Chocolate waves are a type of orographically generated intelligravity wave. Um, so essentially, Earth's forced over mountains. Uh, and if stability increases with the height in the atmosphere, that energy can be trapped in a layer. Um, and then the, that energy can propagate downstream and you end up with these sort of wave-like structures, um, or these wave structures, rather. Um, you can get these regions of sort of strong turbulence that form around the waves, uh, or rotors, um, which are quite important to forecast, and the Met Office are quite keen to forecast them well for um, aviation and that sort of thing. I've broken everything here. There we go, right. Um, so yes, um, lee wave hazards, um, they're important to advise aviation, um, et cetera, on the risk of turbulence. Um, and it's important to, um, so one of the things the Met Office do at the minute is create these sort of low land charts, they're called low level aviation, um, showing the weather forecast below 10,000 feet relevant to aviation. There's a load of information on here, um, things like visibility, freezing temperatures, 
um, hilled fog and wave activity as well. And these are quite a time consuming plot to produce, I would guess, with a lot of information synthesized. So forecasting at the Met Office, uh, they used used to use a linear model called 3D bomb. So 3D velocities over mountains. It was linear, it was dry, it was very simple. Um, and they used vertical profiles to produce sort of risk-like factors for wave activity. Um, but since the new dynamical core got introduced, um, Lee waves have been resolved in the operational UKV models of the high resolution um, forecasting all over Britain and Ireland. Um, it's far more sophisticated than 3D bomb and it forecasts Lee waves well in comparison with observations. Um, so the current way to do things, so this is here is vertical velocity, so vertical wind speeds at 700 hectopascal. And you can quite clearly see on this example, you've got some nice wave-like structures over Britain and Ireland uh, with some fairly high amplitudes over Scotland, say. Um, but the current way to do this is leeway forecasting still uses the old 3D bomb tools of sort of throwing these features and smooth out um, convection and that sort of thing that's also in there. Um, so what I've been doing is given the ways we resolved in the UKV, we can train a neural network um, to predict to produce wave location and characteristics uh, rather than reinvent the wheel and spit out something else. Um, so since we can see those by eye, can we use machine learning um, as a tool to post-process this information to produce some sort of potentially useful tools for forecasters? Um, so what we did was hand-labeled some um, sizes of UKV. So this is 700 hectopascal vertical wind speeds again, and I hand-drew around them um, to produce some wave masks and then use that to train a unit, a type of deep learning model um, to, to detect patterned images and produce sort of wave mask type, oh, masks type. So here's an example of the unit. So on the left-hand side, we spit in our, our vertical velocities. Um, it's sort of 5 tall by 5 tall pixels and three channels, so fairly narrow. And what we do is in the unit, in the sort of encoder step, um, we decrease the sort of X and Y dimensions and increase the number of channels. So that's really good for extracting those features um, with the idea to produce, uh, it learns what waves look like. Um, and then the decoder, we do the opposite. So we um, use those features um, that's been learned and combine with these skipping actions to end up producing a pixel-wise mask of the um, Lee wave. So it's first used for um, medical imaging, imaging scans, and it's used quite commonly now for segmentation problems, sort of identifying the pixels in a cat or a dog, so, um, and also I've had decent success there. So um, here's some results. So we produce these pixel-wise classifications um, like these over large, um, and the black contour shows the regions that the model has predicted as waves. Um, so in most cases, it does pretty well. There's a few cases, say, where that front light structure comes in, um, with some wave-like patterns in there that perhaps aren't truly waves, but um, overall it seems to have done a pretty good job at learning what wave structures look like. Um, so in some test data here, 95% um, test accuracy on the pixel accuracy was my metric I used. Um, and you can see here, for example, it's not predicted this sort of region of convection over the north of Ireland here um, as well. So it's not just a very simple um, velocity detector. So if you like the black line is, um, the model label and the, the dash line is the um, hand label, if that makes sense. So the next thing I ended up doing was um, uh, knowing that the segmentation model performs well, um, can we use this sort of lend information to uh, produce wave characteristics as well? So since we didn't have any real data for characteristics, it was quite hard to label by hand. Um, we created some synthetic data, which is this, these very nice lozenges almost. I had to play around with some adding noise as well to see if that improved our predictions. Um, so back to the unit. So what we did is we froze all the weights in this bit of the model and just this final section in the head, we retrained this um, a few separate times, one for each type of characteristic we wanted to predict. So if you have weight length, orientation and amplitude. So that we kept all this blend information we'd done earlier and just predicted this instead. So hopefully that meant it's still, we were using synthetic data, it still meant we were using what had been learned in the UKV. So if we go look at the example characteristics, um, so we've got the segmentation that I showed earlier, 
um, but we've also got these wavelengths, amplitudes, and orientations as well. So the orientation in this case is um, perpendicular to the wave front, if that makes sense, for like the direction it's propagating. And um, so just to check that because we didn't have truth for this real data, uh, we used the spectral technique as well. So the um, 2D Stockwell transform, the S transform. So there's a paper from Neil Hindley and Co in Bath about using that on um, stratospheric gravity waves. So we borrowed that technique for this. Um, and again, it's not supposed to be a truth because it's just another way of getting this information. Um, but we just wanted to check that our predictions were in line with what was being spat out there. Um, so as you see, there's there's a slight deviation. So for example, in this high case, our MR models, she's not slightly higher amplitudes here in the lower amplitudes, if that makes sense. But oh, no, it does line up fairly well. And the same for wavelength and orientation. And it, again, this shows sort of one of the, the down, downsides of the S-trans film is that because it calculates the frequencies in both the X and the Y direction, you then end up having a division by zero error. Um, so you lose, you don't have a full case where you've got, say, northerly orientated wave. And here's just some, a couple of plots for um, the ML model versus the SNL. So you can see it's quite blocky here, whereas the ML spits out much more smoother characteristics, um, which is quite nice to see. It was also nice to see that they're vaguely in line with what we expect. We roughly expect wavelength of about five to 35 kilometers. So the fact we were getting wavelengths of that sort of length, similar to the S transformers, was nice to see. And the same for the orientation. Um, so here's the ML on the left and the S transform. And we also had the wind direction as well from UKV just to see if there was anything useful there. Um, what was nice is we did seem to get this sort of turning effect over the north of Scotland in this case, which you could see from the pattern of the waves, but less so in the S-transform. Um, and I've rattled through that, sorry. Um, so yes, I've developed a reliable method for detecting um, and classifying trap Lee waves uh, directly from the UK model output. I've got paper in QJ if you're interested. Um, Feel free to ask lots of questions. And there's some interest from national meteorological agencies in perhaps looking at making this operation to see if it helps their forecasting. Um, so, and yeah, finally, I did have a go at um, looking at the forecast for today, though unfortunately, uh, there wasn't much wave activity. Um, so, there we go. Thank you very much. Yes. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, any questions in the room for Jonathan at all? Any questions? No? Any online? Oh, we do have one in the room. Um, do you want to? If... Thanks, Catherine. Just getting the microphone to work. I just... <laughs> Don't uh, come up and stand here, and then live one at home watching. To bring you into the camera, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, yeah, thank you, John. I was I was going to ask. Um, in, um, lee waves are caused by the mountains, which we know yeah. they're they're not going to move. Wondered if you had ever tried this on a an app for, from a different model, maybe over a different area or a different resolution and whether that your technique still works in the same way or it's very specific to UKV okay. over the UK. I did look at some over South Georgia. Um, we had some simulations of that from, it, it was a very similar model. I'm not sure on the full, but it was a fairly high resolution one. And it, it seemed to perform okay. It probably would have needed fine tuning to the region, um, but it was only a preliminary author of it. But it, it wasn't awful, I'd say. Great, that helps it is. I think great, thank you. Any questions online at all? Oh, oh brilliant. Thank sure. you very much. Thank you. Cheers, thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Right. The next presentation is from Jade Gisiano. Uh, she's currently pursuing a PhD in mathematics and computer science. Um at the Mathematics Center of Ecole Polytechnic and Data Sciences. Hopefully I said that correct. Um, signal and Image Processing Lab at ISEP. Um, so yeah, welcome to Jade.
Hello, everyone. I'm Jess Guidiano. I'm really happy to be there today. I'm going to present to you my uh, thesis work. So I'm currently in my third year, and I'm working in collaboration with Ecole Polytechnique and ISEP in Paris. And we have also a partnership with the United Nations uh, Environment Programme. So my work is mainly based on the automatic determination of oil and gas uh, methane emission profile, uh, specifically in the oil and gas industry. So why methane and why the, and why the oil and gas industry? So methane uh, is a short life climate pollutant with a global uh, warming potential over 80 times the CO2. And according to the IPCC, it's responsible for approximately 50% of the global warming uh, we are experiencing. So we have multiple sources of methane emission like industry, coal mining, uh, and wastewater. And the oil and gas sector works second uh, among all the sources of emission. So this industry has a specificity compared to the other one is that the possibility of a 40% reduction of its emission at no net cost. So this is a very important criteria and this makes the methane uh, emission mitigation in the oil and gas industry a priority. So the global methane pledge has uh, set uh, an objective of uh, reducing the global methane emission at least as 30% from uh, 2020, uh, between 2020, sorry, and 2030. And uh, the United Nations Environment Programme has developed a multiple uh, solution and initiative to accelerate the implementation of uh, the objective of the global methane pledge. So we have um, multiple programs at the UNEP, but I will present you a thank you today, uh, introduce you two main concepts. So we have the International uh, Methane Emission Observatory. And uh, the goal of this last one is to provide an open source and reliable actionable data about uh, methane emission. This data will be composed of uh, multiple uh, data stream, including uh, the satellite one. And we have also the MORS project. So this is um, a program who have the objective uh, to collect and uh, attribute methane emission and then uh, notify in near real time the concerned uh, stakeholder. So this initiative has, of course, the objective to uh, reduce the emission and could have analysis about uh, each emission in the sector. So based uh, on this context, um, we introduced the notion of artificial intelligence uh, because uh, when we have to imagine a system where we collect a lot of data uh, in multiple places in the world, uh, the process of analysis has to be automated. It's really important. So we uh, use AI in this concept and also the, the specificity of the data, of uh, the satellite data we could have and uh, today we'll present you three parts of this concept, which is the automatic uh, detection of oil and gas infrastructure, and then the automatic association of methane emission to this infrastructure. Then we will finish by a presentation about uh, the potential uh, of analysis that we could have with such a uh, system. So first, when you could imagine when you have uh, a satellite uh, images with a methane plume, you would like to know what uh, is at its origin. So for that, we look at the satellite images of the ground where the methane occurs. And then what we want to do is to have an automatic detection and recognition of the infrastructure we have at the ground. So today we'll present you uh, Three main recognition, uh, three main infrastructure that we, we want to recognize. So the tank unit, the compressor, and the well. So I precise that this is not the entire infrastructure that we could find in the domain, but the three major ones. So for that, we have the possibility to use uh, algorithm uh, from the object uh, detection category. And uh, we have multiple ones available uh, with uh, different characteristics. So for example, we could find algorithm uh, of the category of one, one stage with the use of Euro, for example, two stage with faster CNN, and also the category of transformers with encoder-decoder. 
So these algorithms are mainly uh, used uh, with, uh, in a supervised uh, training, which implies the conception and the use of a dedicated uh, database for the process. So for that, we have to constitute a database of uh, multiple images, so around uh, 1,000 approximately. So the images is high resolution images like you can see on the on the screen. And we had to manually annotate uh, every infrastructure in a way that the algorithm could learn what infrastructure, how to recognize them, and what type of infrastructure um, it is. So the database is uh, available online uh, with a link just over here and fully accessible, uh, of course. So we compare these three categories of algorithms. And I have to precise that for each algorithm, we have a various model that we could use. So mainly this model uh, differ in terms of architecture, but also in parameter. So for each model, we compare uh, Oh, sorry, for which algorithm we compare the three models uh, accessible. And the results you see on the screen are expressed in uh, average precision and the score just detail here. And you have for each line the result of each model. So for example, if we look at uh, the Euro model, we could see that uh, we could achieve quite good results uh, over 90%. So this is a quite good uh, results. Uh, we then have a category uh, of the faster RCNN results. So you can see that the result is quite uh, average. And then finally, we have a comparison with DTR. And uh, you could see that for some category, for example, the compressor, the, the result could be uh, very, uh, very good. So it just depends a little bit uh, of which infrastructure we are looking for, but, but in general, all this model uh, could have advantage. So if you look a little bit on the picture, so you could see that yellow that appear to be in the total, the best one. This is not uh, obviously the case for every image we test. So for example, if you took this one, you could see that only one compressor could be uh, detected with this model. And if we took faster CNN with very intermediate results, you could see that on the screen is able to actually uh, detect all the compressor we have. So it just depends a little bit on this case. So it's just a point to precise that this algorithm are quite performant, but still are not uh, 100%. So then when uh, we have uh, detected this infrastructure, what we obtain at the end is uh, the box in box uh, around each infrastructure. So it's quite a, a square, a little square around uh, each infrastructure. And this square, you could easily find uh, the coordinate, geographic coordinate of the position. So that's why we are looking for actually to obtain the coordinates of the detected uh, infrastructure. And then of course, we obtain uh, the category of infrastructure. So if it's a well compressor or a tank, that the algorithm is uh, able to uh, forecast by itself. Then when we have the results, we are interested to match the location of the detected infrastructure with the methane plume we obtained initially. So for that, we uh, simply use the overseen distance and compare uh, the distance we have with uh, all the detected infrastructure. So for example, here we have two, the tank unit, and the well. And then we compare the shorter distance between these two infrastructure and the origin of the methane pool just here. So when we consider that uh, the, an infrastructure is close to an emission, we consider that uh, this infrastructure uh, is at the origin of the methane pool. So here again, a, a small precision. Uh, this case is not uh, as easy like that. So there is uh, some precision to uh, some precision have to be bring. So for example, when we talk about uh, the location of a methane panache, it's really important to precise that this model uh, our estimation because they are determined with atmospheric uh, modeling, and uh, this kind of precision. Uh, could have uncertainty, and this uncertainty have to be taken into account. It's really important, especially when we have a case uh, that could be a little bit complicated. So you could see just here, uh, we have a lot of uh, tank, uh, sorry, compressor units, 
And then this kind of S fracture structure could be very close. So it's really, it's not easy like that to attribute an emission. So for example, with the little cross just here to one of these two compressors. So this is a little bit tricky. And we have also evident case in the domain as for example, if you took a site where just one infrastructure is present, the association here, it's quite obvious. But in this case, it's a little bit complicated. So what we suggest is by using this uh, attribution process is to talk more about uh, probability here, according to the uncertainty uh, we have. So you could see an image here where uh, you have uh, the origin of the methane emission, and then you have a circle representing the uncertainty. And uh, we have to take care uh, about a zone that could be undeterministic, uh, it's the zone where we couldn't, uh, we didn't know how to attribute the, the sources actually. So this part is currently uh, in development, and uh, it's just to summarize that we really would like to have uh, a more precision possible in this process um, of attribution. So then, uh, if we gather all these components, so the detection of uh, any of all the infrastructure and also the matching process we could go uh, to a new kind of methane emission inventory. So this process will be based on the use of high resolution uh, satellite database, where we will obtain uh, for each methane plume detected uh, an images that we will bring of the zone where the methane is emitted. Then we will launch algorithm to obtain the list of coordinates of each infrastructure structure detected. And then we will have the matching process where we could attribute uh, every methane plume to uh, the infrastructure. So this process, uh, I precise, uh, will be with the flow of the data we receive uh, with the emission we have and uh, could provide uh, estimation for uh, a quasi-continuous uh, time. So this uh, kind of new inventory is divided uh, in two main components. So we have the dynamic aspect and also the intelligent aspect. So the dynamic aspect hold for uh, the attribution over time, which permit actually to uh, gather over time all the emission for a precise place. So we could follow by the time for what for precise infrastructure, what this emission have been. So we could collect uh, the methane rate and also the infrastructure tip. And then by filtering and being interested with just one infrastructure, we could obtain over time this kind of uh, collection of uh, methane rate. So you have that according to the time. And this is the optation of uh, a time series. This time series is what we call the emitting behavior of a component. It's just the base of uh, the intelligence aspect of the inventory. Uh, the inventory will collect uh, at this base uh, all the, um, the, the time series uh, we have from the dynamic components. And then the objective will be here to create a kind of margin action. So the margin action is really important here because in most of the study of methane, we have a post analysis, which means that the emission occur and then we have an analysis after its emission. Here, with this kind of inventory, we try to be a little bit uh, more proactive and try to integrate um, the principle of forecasting, special temporal forecasting, like, like for example, to know which kind of infrastructure would have uh, a high probability to emit at a specific time, but also the quantity that could be uh, emit. So with this kind of inventory, we could also have the possibility to uh, characterize a specific event. So for example, we have uh, an intentional leak and intentional leak. So with uh, a sufficient enough time series, uh, we could characterize this kind of event. And we also uh, can aggregate because when you imagine that you have the, the emitting uh, behavior of each infrastructure, you can aggregate it by basin, by country, and by uh, also uh, operator that is processing on the field. So this could be a multi-level analysis and uh, the forecasting aspect uh, could be applicable uh, at each uh, of this level. 
So this creation of margin action is uh, the path actually to go to the, the mitigation of uh, methane uh, emission. Thank you. Thanks, Jade. Any questions in the room at all for Jade? And any online? Okay, we've got a question. Okay, we've got to work. Okay, so there's a question online from Maria, which is, what is the temporal resolution between plume shots? So the temporal resolution uh, typically depends on the satellite data we are uh, using uh, because uh, we have the notion of uh, revisit time uh, and it just depends. So the one in our study uh, is not fixed for the moment. We just are uh, developing a proof of concept. So we are not actually treating, uh, I will say, real continuous data, but we are working with a point source satellite, change set data. And also the data from uh, Sentinel, so it's not continuous, but uh, so the, the time I will say is uh, according uh, to the request of um, of any companies because when we are working uh, with uh, point source satellites, is a company that is actually uh, asking uh, to have a scan on a specific region. So for the temporal scale, it just depends on the demand of the company. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, so, yeah, here's to the next three speakers. Um, we have Matthew Chantry next from the uh, ECMWF. He's the uh, machine learning coordinator and the head of innovation platform. Uh, his background is in numerical modeling of fluid dynamics. And for the last five years, been exploring the value of machine learning for weather forecasting. So over to Matthew. Right. Thanks, uh, Greg. Uh... Can I get my, oh no, I'm going to have to look up or remember my slides. Okay, that's fun. <laughs> uh, thanks everyone for being here and um, those attending online. Uh, I'm very much representing a group of people um, and I myself have done very little of the work, so it's an honor to, um, to, to represent them. And I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, how we see sort of machine learning AI um, uh, uh, sort of across the board for ECMWF and also then uh, talking about the, the AIFS, which is one of our sort of flagship um, enterprises that I think Kirsten made a, a, a reference to earlier. So um, here's a sort of um, uh, sort of uh, schematic, very similar to what the one Kirsten showed about sort of the, the 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 chain that goes into making a forecast. Sort of observations through the process of data assimilation create an initial condition um, through a forward model that then is mapped forward to create um, uh, uh, predictions. Um, but even that is, in fact, now no longer really true for us because already sort of machine learning is starting to appear as part of these chains. So uh, the current operational system that we run daily has machine learning um, uh, sort of assessing uh, the observations that come in, trying to make a flag on whether these uh, look uh, correct um, or, or possibly could be erroneous and could be thrown out from the uh, sort of should be thrown out from the data assimilation simulation process. And something that we've been exploring sort of over the past uh, three, four years is these sort of hybrid works of incorporating machine learning, where we identify some of the, the weakest areas or the slowest areas of our modeling um, a process and try and find ways where machine learning can come in and replace that. And that's a really sort of exciting way to to improve the model it's it's hard work to blend physical modeling and post and sort of machine learning but we're already starting to see gains there I, as an example i'm going to talk about some work on online bias correction in not enough detail so you can ask me about it afterwards but this is the idea where we might um learn the bias of the model and then actually apply that within the model itself to nudge it back to its true reference. So particularly in the stratosphere. So what you're seeing here is um, a, a sort of forecast bias plot as a function of time. I don't know if those online can see this. Apologies if you can't see my pointer, you can hopefully deduce what I'm talking about. And then in 2020, uh, in June, July, we switched cycle and introduced a bias correction scheme um, uh, that was uh, correcting the model uh, within the model. So not as a post-processing step, 
and you can immediately see the sort of gain that we have um, in, in improving this in the system um, and, and, and having a better representation of the atmosphere. And this is actually this uh, a, a, a later version of this sort of bias correction scheme is going to be part of the DA system that's going to generate era six over the next few years. So for us, sort of hybrid use of machine learning is a, is a really exciting one. And despite what you're going to hear about the other work now is not going away in our view at all, but is a, a way to further improve uh, physical modeling by identifying weaknesses and trying to correct for them. However, as Kirsten's talked about, um, and as Matt will talk about um, in, in, in a few minutes time, um, Another approach has dawned, a one far more extreme in its use of machine learning, and that's the one I'm going to spend more time talking about um, uh, here. Um, and that's the idea that not the entire chain, but a significant part, the forward modeling part, could be done with machine learning itself. And um, even just, I think, two and a half years ago, I said to Matt and some of his colleagues at DeepMind that I thought it was very unlikely this is going to happen, partly because there have been some interesting studies shown that it didn't look like there was enough data, even if you started to use the sort of CMake archives of that. But I was wrong, and that's great, because it's far, far more exciting to have new innovative ways of doing forecasting. And so I have a timeline as well. I no longer try and keep it up to date because it got too busy and there's too much innovation in the area. But I think for me, sort of um, 2022, particularly in February, when you had uh, forecast net and work from, from Ryan Keisler, and then particularly um, Pangu weather in, in, in November 22 onto, onto uh, uh, GraphCast, which you'll hear about later, really showed that this wasn't a necessarily a toy problem, which had really been done when, by some of my colleagues exploring this at a sort of very coarse resolution prediction of 500 uh, hectopascal geopotential height. Um, but that this was the real deal. And, and a great example of this was training to minimize just mean squared error for most of the variables was producing sort of impactful results in terms of possibly more accurate tropical cyclone tracks than the IFS. So even though that wasn't the, the end goal, it was part of the mixture of things that you were looking to predict, um, some, some, some important and extreme events were occurring in these uh, physics-driven models in these machine learning driven models rather, excuse me. So since then, there's been a lot of work. It's constantly um, uh, moving uh, with really great innovations. And what I think is particularly interesting is how many outsiders have been able to come into the field and offer their insights sort of blended with our data or our advice on what can be done. And that's really helped drive the field forward that we get some fresh thinking to complement all the existing thinking in the room. And it's that blend that is moving us forward so quickly, I think. So I'm now going to talk to you about sort of what's been our sort of adventure in this over the last um, the last years. Um, and the first thing that sort of started really um, uh, the sort of end of end of 22 and, 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 and beginning of 2023 was sort of how good are these sort of not just reading the papers, um, sort of assessing what this is, but are these really a viable product when you get into the nitty gritty? Are there going to be things hidden, the devil in the detail? And so, uh, and how to establish trust possibly in this new type of operational forecasting system. So one of the things we were working on in sort of first half of, of, of 2023 was coupling these uh, models, the ones that have been made publicly available, which is a wonderful endeavor by um, Huawei, by NVIDIA, by, by DeepMind and others, um, coupling them to our operational pipeline. So not running them on era five on hindcast uh, examples, but running them daily on real initial conditions and then making that data available for everyone so we can get as many eyeballs on as possible on the real forecast, allowing sort of users to come back and tell us or tell the model developers, here's what's going right, here's what's going wrong. I saw this interesting test case or I've done this interesting evaluation. So we've made a, a tool that tries to make it easier for people to uh, run these models themselves. It standardizes the interface to ForecastNet, GraphCast, Hangu Weather, uh, all of the models that have been made, sort of, or most of the models that have been made open, open source and sort of freely available, um, and means that you can run all of them in the same way, and the data comes out in the same format with the sort of uh, grib, grib metadata that some of us love and some of us uh, hate in the community. Um, and sort of... Our sort of summary from this, I, I had previous versions of the talk where I've gone into more detail about this, but our summary of this is, yes, they appear to be the real deal. That there, there are caveats still to be held. They are not sort of 
better than operational sort of the IFS or the Met Office model or, or other centers across everything, but there are already lots of applications where they, they look plausible and they look like they should be a, a comp complementary approach to making a forecast. So scores are definitely not anything, but just to show you sort of what this, what this is. So we've got the IFS, which is our system in red and a whole load of different machine learning models in colors. And you can see with the exception of, of ForecastNet, which is now one of the oldest, which is partly why, all of these models are, are beating um, over a season of evaluation, but it doesn't really matter which one, uh, the IFS uh, for uh, temperature in the Northern Hemisphere extratropics. And they're doing it for some of them with, with, with a fair amount of, of gap. So um, these are really impressive results. And what's more is not just sort of <laughs> how, how impressive the results are, but once trained, how cheap these models are to run and what a force for good that could be. So um, this is trying to, the, the units are a bit sort of, there There are sort of compute units that we measure sort of a combination of uh, the amount of um, uh, sort of uh, uh, nodes, energy, time, and disk space that we use. So or not disk space, sorry, um, uh, sort of time and uh, compute unit, uh, uh, time and CPUs we use. This is approximately the cost of what it took to generate uh, sort of era five and era six will be even more expensive than this. Um, this is how much it costs to run a single forecast of our high resolution system. And uh, this approximately, depending on which version it is of, of a GraphCast, a Pangu, or our own version AIFS, is down this sort of fractional ant here. And so there's a, there's a, there's a few messages to take away from this. One, the ant can't at the moment exist without the elephant. This is the necessary training data set to get there. And without this, this would not be possible. But era five is already being made and era six is being is, is starting to be worked on at the moment and has many, many uses. So it's still a public good to go and create. And what it is, enables us is to bring down this by thousand, perhaps 10,000, the energy cost of making a forecast. What does this allow us to explore? Well, it could mean that more people are able to run their own forecasts. From a global perspective, this doesn't add a lot of extra value, but if you think about high resolution limited area modeling, which we're starting to see a dawn on, this could enable more countries that don't have the infrastructure to run uh, a sort of physics based model to run over Africa or so, some of the poorest parts of the world. Or, or additionally, to be running larger ensembles. So ECMWF, we're big believers that probabilistic forecasting is really the way to do things over the particularly the two week and beyond headline sort of we now don't run a single particularly high resolution model over the others we have an ensemble that's all at the same resolution nine kilometers because we think that's the main sort of um uh, use case that or, or the, the that's the main way people should be interacting with these these forecasts and so we can afford to run 51 members of that but with this price reduction you could be easily envisaging that taking that number to the moon. Now, whether users are ready to deal with the data is another matter, or, or, or whether there's skill for a large ensemble is another matter. But these are some of the sort of promising potentials uh, that we might want to, to have from this. So that was step one, sort of like, we think this is the real deal. We think that this is going to be a way that forecasts are generated. We can, you can ask me the question you asked Kirsten of, will it replace, will it complement? And I'll, I'll give an answer to that <laughs> after. But we see there definitely being value in the, um, in, in the operational uh, chain for this. There will certainly be machine learning forecasts in the future. So that meant we had to build our own model. So why do we think we have to do that? Well, because all the work that's coming out at the moment is really aimed at having a really cool scientific paper and sort of pushing the cutting edge for a, for, for a research project. Whereas right. an operational forecasting system is something you want to be developing and upgrading year after year after year. So for us, this meant we had to invest in sort of learning the skills that we didn't have, incorporating the skills that we do have, and this being something that we can develop and further improve over the years. Um, so yeah, so uh, what we're aiming for is a probabilistic system. We'll come back to that in a bit. But what we started with was trying to build on all the cool work that um, Pangu, uh, 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 GraphCast, ForecastNet have all done. And this meant sort of trying to develop a competitive deterministic system. Um, so Matt, I think, might talk more about graph neural networks. I'm not going to go into very much detail about them, um, but that was our method of choice for the first version. And the other key design choice we made was to really operate on a very coarse resolution grid. So one kilometer grid, so far more coarse 
than uh, by, a fa by a factor of approximately 10 than our operational forecasting system. What? Well, yeah, yes. Yeah. One degree, thank you, Matt. He's paying attention, which is impressive. So, uh, one degree. Uh, it's written there, so you should listen. To, you should trust my slides more than you trust me. So, it's a factor ten more coarse than the operational system. But if you care about sort of large scale synoptic patterns, the interesting thing from this really rather cheap model to train is that this is competitive or perhaps even more skillful than the IFS, even when it's one degree. So we don't know with a physical model how to subgrid parameterize that much at a one degree resolution, but the machine learning is able to, to, to capture those subgrid scale uh, events at a, at a really rather coarse uh, re resolution. And what this means is it's a really fast and cheap model to develop. So we can explore the design space of how we might want to build a machine learning model. And others um, could, could, could do the same or could th think of trying to create climate models or, or, or others uh, for this period. So this is, this is my sort of favorite result, actually, from the work we've done ourselves, is seeing how with a really coarse model, you can get a really skillful forecast if, you, if you're thinking about the large scale behavior. If you want small scale of events, if you want sort of accurate tropical cyclone eyes or really intense tropical um, precipitation bands, this is not the model for you. But if you want to see about the large scale predictability of the atmosphere, this is a lovely model. Uh, so what we were really keen to do is get a model out there as soon as possible, because feedback from our member state users or people around the globe was really important to us. Sort of with machine learning, we can be directly retraining or trying to compensate for things that are wrong. So we wanted to get data in the hands of users as fast as possible so that they can help us learn what these models are good for and weak. Because I'd say we spent sort of six months deciding that this was the right thing to do for us. But I wouldn't claim we've done an exhaustive search of how good these models really are. For example, we heard really interesting work on sort of um, uh, vertical wind structure earlier. No one's really looked at the vertical winds in any of these models. Uh, so seeing seeing whether whether these lee waves are there, sort of I don't know. It's quite a coarse resolution, but there's lots of areas of these models that haven't really been probed yet. And so the more people that can access data, the better. So how does this work? Um, so. The training for this, at least for building a deterministic model, is really sort of really rather simple. You take sort of two neighboring time slices from your training data set. Here, this would mostly be era five, and two neighboring time slices would be six hours apart. And you would give it a full state of the atmosphere at one time, and you would ask it to predict the accuracy of a state six hours into the future. And you would penalize that saying, how far away are you from a mean squared error or a mean absolute error perspective? And then you'd run your gradient descent algorithm on a batch of data and try and get to a better model. And you go through era five again and again and again and again, maybe about a hundred times. And eventually you get to a model that is really rather good. There's some extra steps on that, sort of um, fine tuning for extra extra lead time. So you don't just ask your model to, to run one time step into the future, but you apply it to itself multiple times within that training and you minimize errors over a, a range of lead times. But it's still not a big deviation from this very simplistic setting. In terms of the architectures that people use, the, the, the some machine learning solutions, we're now seeing quite a range of possible solutions achieve really rather similar scores, suggesting that as long as you've got enough complexity in your machine learning solution, you will get to a similarly good answer. It might just be one solution is sort of um, slightly better at one thing or, or the other thing, or perhaps it's slightly cheaper to train or more expensive to train. So I think my assessment at the moment is that the architecture doesn't make a huge amount of difference. Um, we went for um, a, a, a data set that's more evenly distributed around the globe. So it doesn't have convergence of grid points with a latitude longitude representation and also a graph that correctly encodes the sort of the, the spherical nature of the earth. Because a lot of those sort of vision transformer solutions, your know, Pangu weather, Feng Wu, Fuji, they really more treat the earth as a cylinder, which I think is going to probably lead to some issues at the poles, although they're quite hard to spot. Okay, so that was version one, but that was still quite a long way behind, um, depending on how you measure it, sort of graphcast or others, because it was quite a lot coarser resolution. And so if you want sort of um, precipitation forecasts or some other things, that's not going to be good enough. So the next step was moving to a new version. And we did this not just by increasing the resolution of the training data, but we changed the model as well. We did this partly because um, this new system is quicker to train. So this speaks to the fact that it doesn't actually maybe matter the architecture, but we can get an answer faster and we can get an answer from less compute units spent. 
So we now have a system that's sort of a blend of um, graph neural networks, uh, which operate on graphs like this and this, sort of moving you from the raw era grid um, onto some sort of uh, latent gridded space. And then uh, sort of transformer blocks. So these are the things that are empowering large language models. These have this mechanism of self-attention that says, what are the grid points near me that I need to be paying attention to to better improve my, 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 my up update my state for where I am now? And the way we imply this is in bands around the globe. So you can see sort of my red dots here, the, the points that they pay attention to in a single layer are in these bands nearby, uh, which should be the ones that are uh, most impactful to this. But because we have many layers in this system, it allows information to propagate in, an in sort of one time step from pole to pole if that's needed. So we train this model. It's a quarter degree model um, on a six hour time step. So very similar to a lot of the state of the art things. Um, it takes a, a good amount of compute, so far larger than the ant to train. So we get 64 GPUs. We run them out for about five days to get there. And we minimize errors over not just six hours, but doing it following the very nice example from, from GraphCast out to three days. And then we use a bit of our operational analysis to, uh, to get a better idea of what our model is going to inject in as an initial condition um, when we run it in operational setting. So, so how good is it? Um, we're quite pleased now. We think we've reached the level where we are um, competitive um, or perhaps uh, gaining in some skill um, across some of the other sort of leading models. I think it depends exactly what you measure as to which model is the best, but we've now achieved really our objective of being sort of um, uh, there when it comes to deterministic skill, which is all we really wanted was a model that's in a good place for us to explore this sort of probabilistic aspect. So here I'm showing um, uh, a sort of anomaly correlation coefficient for Z500 in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. So you'd ideally like to be at 100 all the time. Uh, that's impossible due to chaos. Uh, but, uh, but in fact, um, the, the AIFS, the, the previous one, which is this light blue, uh, GraphCast and uh, are all sort of uh, very close to one another, all with particularly at so day five, six, quite a big lead time over the IFS. Um, and we can see that, um, uh, yeah, so th th this can be seen in some case studies where it's not just that smoothing has helped you get a better score, but you are able to um, sort of have to, to, to bypass some of the biases of the IFS. What about at the surface? This is something where we saw a really big gain from increasing resolution, which is not very, not very surprising from a representativity perspective. So um, the, the light blue is the old version of the AIFS, the, the first one that we, we spun out very quickly. This operates on a one degree grid. We make the grid four times larger, um, also higher resolution, and the, the scores improve quite dramatically. And there's now again, a sort of statistically significant gap um, uh, uh, so that we're better than the IFS. Um, which is even more impressive given that the IFS is running at an even higher resolution. And that's a, that's a big part of this. So we think sort of pushing to even higher resolution will take this curve uh, even lower uh, there. Um, then just a week and a half ago, we, we, we updated the model again uh, because we want to try and make it as good as possible while keeping it uh, live. And what we added in this latest version was precipitation, which is obviously a, a really important prediction for any weather forecasting model. Um, the other thing we know is that um, analysis and reanalysis data is very much imperfect from this. It's our training data set, um, but it really ideally shouldn't be our verification data set. So what I'm showing you here are scores against uh, observations, so uh, observation stations for 24-hour accumulated precipitation. This is for the score that's uh, called SEEPS, um, which uh, is, 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 is an improvement on a sort of mean squared error because it doesn't let you win too much by just saying it's never going to rain very much, which is the problem with mean squared error and precipitation. It's still an imperfect measure, but it says basically, are you in the lower, middle, or upper tercile of precipitation? And then score how accurate you were at getting into that right uh, category. So this is a score where you want to be higher is better. And we've got the sort of um, AIFS uh, sort of version, uh, latest version and the IFS. And you can see that uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, or I could equally have shown Southern Hemisphere extra tropics, the IFS is still the best, at least for the first four days. So we've got work to go if we want to try and beat the IFS on every possible thing, or at least see if it's possible. But in the tropics where predicting precipitation is, is very hard for physical models, um, there's already a, a, a quite significant gap in terms of um, how well we're able to do that. 
Now, I think this gap is, is a bit misleading if you care about sort of the most extreme precipitation forecast. So this is not a claim that this is really a done deal, but already when training on, on data sets such that era five that doesn't really properly represent extreme precipitation, it's already quite a lot of promise that this can lead to uh, very accurate precipitation forecasting models. Tropical cyclones, this one, and I could here be showing the Graphcast or Pangu or ForecastNet or any of these, because they all share a similar story in terms of the, the, the two tails that, or the two, the two plots that we might plot. So this is showing how accurate the tropical cyclone track is. So this is the uh, sort of um, the track error, uh, showing it for uh, our IFS high resolution model and various versions that we've been incrementing up here. And particularly if you can look at sort of day two, three, you can see there's a really significant gap there in terms of how, how much more accurate this is. Now, there are some caveats. This is based on only one year of data, which is can be a bit misleading for tropical cyclones. Um, and the other element that to, to caveat is that a lot of these gains are actually not in sort of the cross track location, but a long track location. So these machine learning models are doing a better job of getting the propagation speed of tropical cyclones, whereas the gains in terms of accuracy of exactly where the strike's gonna be are still there, but they're more limited, but that contributes a lot. But obviously, for tropical cyclones, um, the location is only one part of the story. How strong that's going to be is, is also really important. So here I'm showing sort of this is observation data of, 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 of what you'd like to see in terms of a relationship between the central pressure and the wind speed, showing that you can reach, uh, if you look at the sort of climatology of events in your system, some really intense events. We see that our operational model does quite a good job, but still struggles to um, estimate sort of really intense events. Um, but it's still quite a big gap there to um, machine learning models. And I could again add sort of Graphcast or Pangu or, or, or those to this setting. So there's still work to be done in terms of estimating um, the, the central pressure, but particularly the wind speeds of this event. And so this is, this is still a work in progress for the community to make these models fit for purpose for every single application, which I think should at least be the, the aspiration of this approach. And also as of, um, uh, uh, what day is it? About a week ago, you can now play with this data yourself. So um, we now put this data out as part of our open data offering. So a uh, one hour um, after it's sort of made available to member states or, or sort of paying customers, anyone can get free data for themselves. They can go and download it from our website, get whichever variables they want from the last three days worth of forecasts and go and test it for their application and hopefully come back and tell us whether it's any good or not so that we can help make it better. Um, so uh, you can go and get uh, data. Uh, if you were to search for AIFS machine learning data, you can go and see this. And graphical products for some of the headline variables are available on charts. You can also see graphical products for lots of the other machine learning models. So we're now hosting currently four of them. So Graphcast, Pangu Weather, ForecastNet, and uh, Fushi um, are all available so you can compare and contrast, see if they're giving you a similar prediction because they do share an initial condition or see where they deviate from one another or deviate from the, the operational um, system. So um, step four, where am I with time, Greg? I lost track. Plenty. Okay, so that was really a warm up because, because and I'm going to talk about this and then Matt's going to talk about this a bit from what, what Google DeepMind have been working on. So deterministic forecasting really a few days out starts to lose its value. And probabilistic forecasting is where, is where it's at. It's where we now spend our compute resources. The last upgrade of our supercomputer, the motivation was said, let's take the ensemble to, 10, to nine kilometers rather than doing anything to our high resolution. Let's merge the two into one product because we think that's the most valuable thing. So how do we go about building an ensemble system and also sort of um, uh, trying to sort of improve the products that we're not very good at at the moment? Um, uh, so, yeah, and that's just to say sort of uh, if we go back to this first slide that I had, our, our physical uh, physics system at the moment doesn't just produce one output. Uh, what do we do? Well, we have a set of initial conditions. We have 51 different initial conditions that we generate. And then we run them through a physics model that has some representation of its own uncertainty. So we're capturing two aspects of uncertainty, which is going to be key. We're capturing uncertainty about the current state of the atmosphere and then uncertainty in our model. And this, in its sense, is, is somewhat of a statistical model here. There's some tuning parameters that calibrate how uncertain our model is and where it has uncertainty. So there's particular 
uncertainty in the physics-based system around our parameterized physics, because we say they're some of the areas that we're least confident in. And so we then propagate this forward, we, we run this 51 times, and we get an ensemble uh, that we can then use to look at scenarios of, of different events. So already by one metric, actually, even without representation of model uncertainty, the AIFS looks quite exciting. Um, so if we initialize the AIFS with the same initial conditions that we run our ensembles, so we run a 50 member ensemble forward from these different, so, so we're representing initial condition uncertainty, but we don't do anything about model uncertainty, we're, we behave like the model is certain, uh, then we get the following chart, which is measuring CRPS, uh, a continuous probabil rank probability score, which is sort of the headline metric for for, for probabilistic forecasting. It's not the only one, but it's a good sort of first estimate of, of how accurate you've been. So just to keep you on your toes, this one now lower is better. And you see here the IFS and the, the AIFS, or actually a, a slightly out of date version, and see that already the two are very competitive one with one another. They lie on a very similar chart. And you might say, well, there's no need for model uncertainty. The, the job's done, we're already done. But that's a myopic view. So uh, we can look at a different measure. So here I've got twice as many lines because I'm showing two things at once. The, let's get this the right way around, the full lines for each of these two models, so the color schemes being kept the same, show the root mean squared error of the ensemble mean. So that shows how accurate the ensemble is or via its sort of mean estimate. And the dashed lines are showing the uh, uncertainty of the ensemble, so the standard deviation of the ensemble. And as a sort of first order estimate, you would like these two to rise in parallel with one another. You would like the spread and the error to, 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 to match such that you had a model that captured the truth in the ensemble uh, sort of uh, uh, as many times as your ensemble is large, or you, you would want it to uh, capture, capture the truth within in the spread of the ensemble. And what we see here is at least out for quite a few days, and it depends on the variable exactly this score, the IFS is really quite good at this. Um, the, at least to day six, you see the two lines, the, the black dashed and the black full, lie right on top of one another. But you don't see this for the AIFS. You see a significant gap here. You see it is um, overconfident. The spread is too small. And so it would give you a misleading estimate of what was going to happen in the future. It would tell you that the cone of tropical cyclone tracks would be very narrow. And then more often than you would like, the true tropical cyclone track would fall outside of it. So this is why this is not the correct way to do. What we need to do is incorporate model uncertainty. What does this look like from a machine learning perspective? Well, this means finding a way to shape noise effectively as part of the learning process um, into an uncertainty of the model. Teach the model by showing it lots of examples exactly how, how and where the uncertainty should be and how and where it should be combined with the state. And so Matt's going to talk about GenCast later this afternoon that shows one way. It's going to be using the sort of diffusion technique uh, to explore this. We've been exploring a, 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 an alternate approach. We're not quite as far along, but I wanted to show you an update on where we are there on trying to directly minimize skill scores themselves. So this headline score that we had here, we're going to try and minimize it in the training procedure. So replace the mean squared error or mean absolute error that we use there directly target a probabilistic skill score and try and use that to guide the model how to be uncertain about its future. So what does that look like? Well, so the deterministic training, you would take an initial condition, uh, sort of you would encode it into this sort of space. You would do some lots of, uh, lots of nonlinear calculations on top of it. You decode it out. You'd score how accurate it was against the mean squared error. And then you back propagate that to try and improve the model. So what do we do? Well, we're actually going to um, get an ensemble of initial conditions. And we're going to, for each of them, we're going to provide additional random noise that the model's going to learn how to structure. So this is just sort of extra noise to learn how to apply. And then we're going to, through the same model, propagate this initial condition and a random noise through this n times to build an ensemble. Then we're going to score it with a proper skill score. So this is going to be the CRPS. And then we can back propagate that to try and improve the CRPS. So every step of our minimization journey is going to be trying to find a score that better, better, be, that better matches this. And the nice thing about the CRPS is it's going to reward you both to be um, sort of accurate, but also not overconfident. If your model is overconfident, you're going to be penalized in this score. So is it working? 
So uh, we're at the stage of we've got some small models, sort of equivalents to this sort of one degree model I showed before, except a, a bit smaller. So uh, this is the, the plot I showed you before, showing the overconfidence of our sort of, um, sort of daily run deterministic model. And you can see this gap. And if I do the same thing now for minimizing score, you can see that the two lines have become much closer together. So we're not quite overlapping, so there's still some work to do, but there's clearly been some representation of model uncertainty learned. The error is larger, but that's partly because we've got a, a worse model at the moment, because it's a, an easier thing to do experimentation on. But clearly by learning to represent model uncertainty, we are bringing those two um, uh, sort of more, more in comparison. So what's next? Um, so we're going to be working on sort of further development of the AIFS ensemble system and uh, bringing you along the way. So we have a blog where we try and update people uh, on our progress, what we've been finding, what's interesting. So you can have a look at that if you want to see sort of the latest things. We're working towards opening of everything. So the first step on the journey was open data. Um, the next step is going to be sort of open inference code so that people can run the AIFS as they can run GraphCast, Pangu Weather, ForecastNet, so that you can play with this yourself. You can figure out how good it is for yourself. Maybe tell us if you find something interesting. And then later down the line, we want to share with the community the sort of toolbox that we've built so that people could train their own models for their, for their own purpose. So we're working on making our code uh, more reliable so that other people can use it and, and, and build on top of what we've done. Uh, we need to have a paper because talks are only a sort of fragment of the details you'd need to do to duplicate the effort. And that's not really uh, contributing to the open scientific literature in the full way. So we'll be working on a paper. And then as I was talking to a few people in the coffee break, sort of for me, extended range prediction is a really exciting avenue to push forward. So uh, there, there's room, I think, there to push the envelope of scale in sort of week three, four, week five, six predictions with these approaches. Once you start to incorporate some of the slower processes in the system, once you incorporate oceans, uh, land, uh, sea ice into that. And as part of Destination Earth, um, which is sort of uh, uh, EU flagship enterprise, we're going to be looking to do exactly that. So build components of this model um, for these uh, different parts of the Earth system so we can really sort of move towards a sort of machine learning uh, digital twin. Uh, we're also starting to engage with National Met Centers to work with them. They're all really keen to sort of um, embrace this journey. Sort of Kirsten talked about their work before, but that's happening across Europe and worldwide. Um, and so that's a really exciting thing. And then perhaps the most alluring prospect is if we would go back to that slide at the beginning and see that we're only really attacking the second half of the chain is this idea of do you need reanalysis to train these models? It certainly creates a very good model at the moment, but we have now, since the dawning of the sort of satellite era, a large amount of different observations of the Earth system. Um, they are not as nice to use as era five. Uh, <laughs> they come with many of their own complexities and difficulties, um, but uh, this would be the sort of real um, sort of... Uh, moonshot as Kirsten talked about earlier because then sort of we spend about an hour doing our data assimilation pipeline and then an hour doing the forecast so we've saved about one hour by possibly replacing if you would believe that sort of forecasting model if we were to take that decision but there'd still be an hour to get the initial condition state of the atmosphere if observation driven forecasting is possible um, then you could really reduce that cost quite dramatically and um, the other thing that I don't have on this slide, but I want to stress really importantly, is this is just one side of the coin, uh, one I thought that was probably more appropriate for this group. But for us, the sort of hybrid machine learning IFS sort of forecasting is also a really exciting way to, to move forwards. We're still, we have lots of scientists at ECMWF exploring different ways that we can incorporate machine learning there. In our next operational cycle, we'll be bringing stuff in to better represent sea ice with machine learning. I talked about the sort of bias correction into era six. Um, this for us is a complementary approach because unless sort of observation driven forecasting can happen, then development of the IFS and that means incorporation of machine learning is the best sort of holistic way to improve our forecasting. So thank you very much. And I look forward to some good questions. Right, that was great. Any questions from anyone in the room? Oh, yes. Pass the microphone over. Stand up. Thanks. Um, so you mentioned earlier that the machine learning um, 
model emulators were getting subscale processes better on that smaller resolution well, that- I, I'm, I'm saying what i'm saying is that a, a, a one degree version of the ifs would perform quite a lot worse than a one degree version of the sort of aifs so our our closure schemes that we have at one degree uh don't seem to be as clever as a machine learning closure scheme it's able to better better sort of fill the gaps at a coarse resolution it doesn't need resolution in the same way if what you're talking about is the large scale synoptic patterns there's still plenty of great reasons to move to high resolution but i'm more saying for me the nice thing is i was seeing the field evolve if a quarter degree or perhaps higher was necessary to produce these models that it could become quite a um, a small club of people who had the resources to train these things and so it would sort of possibly stifle innovation for people who had just one or two GPUs and wanted to explore different methodologies to improve it. So I guess the message I wanted to set, send there is at a, at a one degree model, I think you can already start to explore how we can make these model, how we can make them even better. Okay, thank you. Oh, yeah, really interesting talk. Um, you've shown a lot of statistics and your training on RMS uh, errors. I just wondered if you've had any feedback about how the evolution of the actual field really looks and how realistic that is. So like, for example, a forecaster who's looking at this tropical cyclone and seeing it, how it's developing in relation to other synoptic features and all the other observational data that they have available. Have you had any feedback whether they find that's a useful tool in that context? Because it's rather different from looking at the statistics. It, it is, and it's complementary. And I didn't have time today to talk about. We've we've done quite a lot internally of sort of case studies to look at interesting events, particularly to try and unpick sort of make more extreme events, particularly for for wind speed or for temperature, and see that already for extreme events there's some promise, but there's still more work to be done. We're just starting to get the first feedback from forecasters at the moment, and I hope that that continues. Um, I think on tropical cyclones, the main thing I've heard is that there's less jumpiness, actually, from sort of initial condition to initial condition uh, than the um, uh, that, than the, the IFS or other physics-based models. And I think um, that's certainly different. So whether they're preferring that or not, is you'd have to speak to them. But that's my hope for sort of the next year is now that we sort of, we have a model um, that people can use for many different events, we start to get this feedback. We're gonna be working on a study where we try and interview lots of forecasters and find out, yeah, exactly these sorts of details. Cause it's really important. The statistics are only one half, but that's the half we have so far. Hey, thanks. Uh, a couple of questions, if I may. Um, for the loss function that you're using, do you experience the blurring that Graphcast perhaps suffers from as you go forward in in time for the forecast time horizon? Uh, to, uh, to a to a lesser degree, uh, we, we, we it it it's certainly lessened. The degree to which it's sort of gone is unclear because we're still this is very recent development work. So I, I we've not done a complete study of that yet because we've not really trained a model that we think we're happy with. What we mostly want to see is the loss is, is, is dealing with that. Matt is going to talk about um, the fusion models and show that a lot of that blurring artifacts goes away, but I won't sort of uh, with, with his approach. But from my perspective is there's a few different ways of going about probabilistic forecasting. Sort of diffusion is one really interesting technique. It has some drawbacks with the sort of cost, but we wanted to explore a complementary approach so that as a community, we can sort of move that forward but it's the right question but i just don't have the answer yet and perhaps a more general question because i imagine this is built using say tensor flow which in, in the back end has the algorithmic differentiation built in does that offer advantages when it comes to say 4d var for data assimilation and perhaps calculating the singular vectors as well possibly yes i think for singular vectors that yeah that could be an interesting way of going about it um for 4d var you have currently the issue of uh it's the models are working in quite a reduced sort of state space compared to the ifs or similar things they have far less vertical structure and they don't currently offer all the parameters of choice so you wouldn't be able to naturally pair them with your observation operators because you don't have uh, a raw sort of cloud cover sort of output or or the sort of fine scale vertical structure that you'd need for the observation operators. So you'd either need to expand the state space to, to be much closer to the IFS or similar models, or uh, sort of maybe adapt the observation operators to cover with that gap. But yes, um, 
We're exploring this at the moment, actually, the sort of auto differentiability for more the hybrid approach at the moment, because we think it's quite useful for sort of uh, helping us keep up with development in the physics scheme, where so in the physics world, where someone might have a good idea for a new radiation scheme, but then the the the, the necessity to create a tangent linear and adjoint version of the code sort of sort of dampens that sort of speed of, of, of progress. So that's probably where we're going to start in that area, but it, it could be interesting um, there. Lovely, thank you. Uh, we've got some questions online, and then if we've got time at the end, we could always come back to the, the room questions. Um, does AIFS need to be retrained? If so, how frequently? Uh, yeah, that's a, a good question. So um, uh, Matt and colleagues um, that I'm putting a, a decent amount of pressure on now, uh, in their graphcast paper, they looked at uh, forecast accuracy as a function of going away from your training period as you sort of moved one, two, three, four years away. And they saw that there was some drop off. The model didn't fall off a cliff. It was still very good. But if you wanted the most accurate model, train, retraining with recent data would be advantageous. So I see there being value in doing that. The sort of how regularly you should do that is another question sort of um, uh, we do a sort of yearly cycle with the sort of the IFS at the moment. So uh, that could set a time scale, but there's nothing to stop you training far more regularly, particularly if you're just showing it a recent, a small amount of recent data. So I think that will be an interesting sort of research uh, angle. Lovely, thank you. And can paying customers get IFS grid output faster than one hour after real-time dissemination schedule? Soon. I think we're still... We're still building our pipelines, but yes. <laughs> and um, a question about adding random noise to each input from ERA5. How have you chosen the variance of the noise for each node? Since ERA5 data comes also from measurements, they are affected by uncertainties. Yes, yeah, so um, I think I didn't do a very good job of my expi ex expect explanation. So we're not... Um, adding the, the, the noise is provided as additional information. It's not added to the initial conditions. So the relative balance of the two is sort of just a an extra parameter for the model to do. So we choose sort of unit Gaussian noise, and then the, the first layers of the model can decide the relative importance of the noise, which should be very small compared to the information-rich era five states, but it's not added directly on top. The machine learning decides how to combine them. Lovely, thank you. Um... Still got a couple of minutes, so we can go back to the room. Hi there, it's been really interesting. Um, it's more general, really. So what are the technical challenges that you faced moving to this this method of, of you know, forecasting? Um, no, hardware and teams, actually, and understanding of the IT professionals that probably help you deliver this sort of thing. Just an idea of sort of the challenges you faced moving along this way, because it's accelerating rather quickly, isn't it? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a great question. Thanks. I think um, I think it's in a few places, but I, I think I've been amazed at how much enthusiasm people have to try these new things and to embrace this. Sort of my colleagues at ECMWF, a lot of them who hadn't been doing any machine learning just a, a year or so ago and now actively making really significant contributions. So I don't let this be a put off. Like you don't need to have been doing machine learning for many years to make a really active contribution in this space. Um, you can you can learn quickly and do stuff. And the, the data access patterns and how you want to store data for training efficiently is one thing that sort of looks quite different to how you would normally sort of pass through a data set if you just wanted to calculate statistical errors because you have this sort of pathological read pattern where you want to go and deliberately at random go and get a random slice of, of era five and then some neighboring information so how you lay that down on disk and what that means for other users of your hpc is is is, is one element sort of um uh, i think another thing is the met community has at least we have been very big on sort of bit reproducibility on everything and that's really hard with machine learning. Sort of, you can, if you control for absolutely everything, get to the same model. Um, if you if you seed absolutely everything, but it's going to come with a big computational overhead, and that's both in training and in inference. So I think that's a sort of mindset shift or a decision to make. Are we willing to accept the fact that even if we run the same model twice, once we've trained it, it gives slightly different answers because we don't lock the GPU to doing the operations in the same order, and so sort of rounding error of accumulation can can do it. So 
those are those are those are two examples I would talk about. But I I'd, I'd say we're still learning that actually. I think we're still we've not solved everything. We're we're on a journey at the moment, and um, uh, yeah, I, it's going to be exciting. I can imagine. Yeah, moving by HPC to this method is is a step change. Yeah, but I guess also you talked about hardware. We don't have very many GPUs on our system. It's a wonder actually. I, I have to thank my predecessor in this role for saying that we should have at least some GPUs on our system when we got it to a couple of years ago, because we upgraded our system just before this all hit. And so the fact that we even had any has been really useful in doing some because uh, porting sort of porting sort of physical solvers to GPUs is a really hard bit of work. We're doing it as well, but um, sort of we really are used to sort of CPU heavy infrastructure and that doesn't work, particularly not for training. For inference, you can get the inference time down, actually. So you can make predictions on CPUs, but for training, you really need, need these. So that's another element. That's great. Thank you. Brilliant. I'll um, stop the questions there, as I'm sure we could keep going, but um, we'll move on to the uh, the next presentation. Um, so we're delving into uh, the oceans now with uh, Eugeet. And um, he's from the Royal Academy of Engineering Research. Well, he is a Royal Academy of Engineering Research Fellow. Um, and with a focus on development and deployment of optimization algorithms to aid the offshore renewable energy sector. That's great. Thanks for that. I'll just I didn't prepare my interpretive downs for this. There we go. Thank you. So thanks for the introduction, Greg. My name is Ajit Pillay. I'm a Royal Academy of Engineering Research Fellow at the University of Exeter. And I'm gonna be presenting some work that we've done in collaboration with uh, the Met Office. So from Exeter, uh, it's myself, my colleague Ian Ashton and Jiaxin Chen. And then from the Met Office, Ed Steele. And um, yeah, it's loosely titled Applications in Oceanography, but I'm neither an oceanographer um, nor sort of a meteorologist. Uh, I'm an engineer, so this is an engineering application in the ocean that we'll be talking about today. Um, specifically, I'll be talking about uh, sort of applications to the offshore renewable energy sector. So when you're looking at, say, an offshore wind farm or offshore tidal installation or anything like that, a lot of your actions at sea, so your installation, inspection, operation, and maintenance, they're all governed by strict weather limits. So at the end of the day, if you're going to inspect a wind turbine, somebody is jumping from a ship onto the ladder. And that's governed by generally a wave height limit that the skipper is comfortable with somebody jumping off his ship. And, and that that's what we're trying to get down. So for, for crew transfer from a vessel to a turbine, you normally look at a wave height of about one and a half meters. If you've got a walk to work system, you can maybe get away with 1.7 or 1.8. Um, if you're doing a heavy lift operation, so for example, you're installing a blade on a, a large wind turbine, you, you're looking for a wave height below half a meter. So being able to accurately estimate your, your wave height in particular um, is a huge importance to the offshore renewable energy sector. And so much so that, so one wind farm, Vikinger Wind Farm attributed costs of 17 million pounds during their installation, just due to sort of scheduling of vessels um, so that's either when they scheduled a vessel, assuming there was a weather window, but then uh, the weather was actually too rough, so they couldn't go out, so they they paid there, or because of delays where they could have gone out, but their forecast has said that they couldn't. So getting that down has tangible benefits to uh, to the sector, in particular when the sector is trying to to cut costs. Now the interesting thing is that a lot of these decisions are end up being made uh, on a relatively short term basis, in particular for uh, turbine transfer. So if you're doing an inspection on a turbine, you'll make that, de that decision that morning, generally. So that morning, your, your operations team and your, your vessel operators will be looking at the weather forecast you have, which turbines need to be visited, and they'll make a decision. A large wind farm can nowadays have up to, say, about 200 turbines. Each turbine should probably be inspected by uh, a technician twice a year. So every day you want to be visiting turbines if you can and having an accurate forecast that says, yes, we can go out to the northwest site uh, portion of the site, but not the southeast is, is valuable information there as well. So that's the context with which I'm coming from, is that we're working with a lot of offshore wind 
operators and they're trying to cut down their, their vessel costs. Um, so what we've done is we've tried to develop a machine learning framework that can work on these time scales. So looking at say day ahead, 12 hours ahead, up to about 48 hours ahead. So not looking at sort of the, the longer term forecast, but looking very much on um, the day, day ahead. The advantage we also have is that most wind farms now will have their own measurements on site. So a, a wind farm will traditionally have at least one wave boy, if not two for some of the larger ones. So we were looking at a way that can we integrate those observations and really drive the forecast from those observations. So what we were trying to do is, is say, can we use say a physics-based model to learn sort of what the, the spatial relationship or distribution is across a site and then use your in situ measurements to then drive that and, and inform that, that sort of spatial view. Um, I won't go too much into this because I think that uh, Matt and others have probably done a better job of explaining this than I will. But the main thing is that you've got, there's lots of different ways of, of sort of doing some of these modeling. Uh, you've got on one side, sort of the physics-based models and then on the other side, something that's purely data driven. Um, and then in between you have observations which are informing uh, both to some extent. And we, we're looking at sort of a hybrid approach where we're using a physics-based model to train the system and then using observations uh, during the system to, to run it operationally. Um, so going a little bit more into detail, um, again, I'll, I'll go through this quickly because I think, again, some of the others have explained this better, but when it comes to wave modeling, so your traditional wave model, you'll have some sort of mesh for your, your region of interest, and that has bathymetry data is sort of the most important input there. So that's your, your water depth throughout the site. You'll then add some boundary conditions, which are traditionally from a global model or some larger scale regional models, um, which will have waves at the boundary. And then you'll add wind across the site. And then from that, um, you'll you'll get out some sort of information about your your wave conditions. And so the parameters we tend to look at are your significant wave height, your uh, peak period, as well as your your mean period, um, and then me mean direction or direction at the spectral peak. Um, and, and as with all sort of traditional NWP, these are characterized by being high computational costs and expensive. Um, most of the forecast services that wind farms will be using will generate a new forecast every six hours. And if you're trying to make sort of decisions for sort of that afternoon or something, you might want to have sort of something that's that's more more recently generated. Complementing that, we so for say a site of interest, you'll you'll have your in situ measurements. So this is uh, the Southwest approaches, which I'll be talking about. Um, as one of our case studies. And sort of around here, there's quite a lot of, of instrumentation, that some of which we've deployed. Um, and so your wave boys give you quite good uh, representation of what's going on at a point. So you have very accurate, high resolution, temporally data at one specific location. And so trying to then extrapolate from that is, is then a challenge. So what we've done is we've tried to take these two pieces together and so we use our in-situ measurements in addition to the hindcast model to, to drive a nowcast. So the hindcast is used purely exclusively in training to learn what the spatial relationship is across your domain. And then in, in operation, you use the, the in-situ measurements as input, and then that produces a, a nowcast. What we can also then do is if you have some method of forecasting at your boy locations, um, so just using quite traditional time series forecasting methods. Um, you can then combine that with your, your now cast, which would then be a forecast and get a spatial forecast. So we've got two separate models, one that produces a spatial representation of your waves, and then one which looks at given your, your time history at your boys, what's gonna happen in the future at those boys. And then by coupling the two together, uh, we get a spatial forecast. Uh, so during training, the surrogate model learns the relationships between the measurement locations in the entire domain, and then in application, we just provide it with the uh, wave data across there. 
Um, so for for the initial development, we've used sort of a very relatively simple model for the the surrogate model for the spatial part of it, and we've we've used a random forest, um, and then that's applied using the a long term hindcast as well as uh, the the in situ measurements. And this, right? So, um, so like I said, we we split the problem into to two separate, um, two separate problems, and so in this case, let's see if this works. Yeah. Um, so, if we the the spatial model using the the random forest is trained purely on the hindcast. So we use the the nodes closest to where the boy locations are as, as input, at, and then train on the the rest of the domain. Um, and the temporal model is trained purely using the network of boys. So the advantage here is rather than treating each of them individually, it looks at what's going on sort of throughout the, the observation network to then forecast. Um, there's some pre-processing which involves gap filling. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever worked with, with wave boys, but you end up quite often getting dropouts, especially during large storms and things, and you'll you'll have errors when they reach the end of their mooring and things like that, that will need to be corrected for. So that's all taken care of in a pre-processing step. Um, and then we, we train the two models separately and then use the output to the temporal model to then run the, 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 the spatial model. And yeah, this is repeating that sort of same idea um, is that in, the key thing for this is that in training, especially for the spatial model, which is quite expensive, we purely use hindcasts. And we've done this with, uh, we use 20 years of hindcast for one model that was 20 years ago. Um, so from 1980 to 2000, roughly. Um, and then in operation, you're just replacing sort of the, the model data with, uh, with real observations. Um, and then the temporal model we've used uh, just an LSTM with some attention um, to, as I said, predict um, the the results across the the whole domain. Oh, sorry, to predict the, the the to forecast across the the network of boy locations. Um, so this is just showing the temporal model when we were sort of developing it versus different. Uh, well. When it was in development, just showing some of the results for purely the temporal side of it. Uh, so here we've got the significant wave height, uh, the mean direction, and the uh, the peak period. And these are all R RSMEs at uh, one of the wave boy at two of the wave boy locations. Sorry, so the colors are or three of the wave boy locations. Each color is a different wave boy location. Uh, the solid line is showing the the UK Met offices forecasting operational forecast um, at the same location. Um, and in general, we see that the Met Office forecast has very stable um, errors at, at all three sites, whereas the uh, the machine learning forecast or the, the neural network, not unsurprisingly, especially for wave height, um, increases with time. Um, with period, we actually find that our errors are much lower. Um, and with direction, there's some there's some annoying differences in how direction is treated uh, between models and measurements when it comes to oceanography, where most of your measurements will return the direction at the spectral peak, whereas most models deal with the mean direction. And under some conditions, those are the same, but under a lot, they are not. So there's always a challenge with dealing with direction. Um, for, for some boys, depending on how they're configured, we can recompute and actually get the mean direction as well. But for, for the boys we've used here, we've used uh, well, we've used quite old boys from deployments from about 10 years ago. So they, they're not configured in a way that we could do that. But the important thing here is that we've got very uh, similar levels of, of error um, just from the temporal model. So this is just looking temporally. Um, and then to, to try to improve this slightly, we also looked at training seasonal models. So rather than having a single temporal model uh, for, for the whole network of, of boys, we then use separate models for, for each season. So uh, we constructed a multi-year rolling three-month window, so centered on the, the month of interest. So uh, ending up with, uh, with 12 separate models, effectively. 
Um, and, and here again, sort of the, we found that using the seasonal data here um, showed with the red line, um, improved the, improved the model consistently at, at all three boy locations that we were looking at. So bringing everything together, so this is the the full sort of looking at the South, UK Southwest approaches. So the area we're looking at is down here, um, sort of roughly around Cornwall, um, predominantly because I'm based on a campus that's in Cornwall and that's where we've uh, run models for and that's where we've done a lot of deployments of wave boys. So it's where we had data and models for. Um, we looked at using two different um, Hindcast models for training. So we used our own SWAN model, which had been trained on 23 years, or which had been run for 23 years. Um, and then we used the UK Met Office's uh, Northwest European Shelf Reanalysis model, which had been, we had 40 years of data. Um, in terms of the voids, we looked at five separate coastal wave voids. Um, and we used uh, the three voids that are shown in red as input. And then we used Oh, sorry, we use these three boys as input and then these two boys um, as validation. Um, and an interesting thing is because of where th this is here, um, sort of at the end of the UK, you get quite different uh, wave systems on the North Coast than you do on the South Coast. Um, and you also get some complexities coming through the channel. Um, so it's quite useful to have validation points on either side um, of the coast. Um, and we looked at significant wave height uh, we looked at two different wave periods as well as the mean wave direction, as I said previously. Um, this is just showing spatially. We've got relatively low um, errors for, for your wave height, um, up to about half a meter. And given that the system's being driven by boy, coastal boys um, sort of here, roughly, it's not unsurprising that our errors extend or sort of increased the closer you get to the boundary. Um, this is just showing sort of some longer time series, but the, the interesting thing is, so when we trained against the, the, when compared with, when we used the model trained, uh, on the Swan model, so this was a high resolution, uh, regional wave model, um, almost all of the parameters, uh, from the, the machine learning model it, have better statistics compared to the Swan. Um, and this was attributable mainly to. Uh, sort of the boundary data. So by driving the, the model by in situ measurements in the interior of the domain, we're sort of breaking the dependency on, on boundary data and any of the errors that are coming from the propagation of that boundary data. Um, so in particular for this domain, if I go back here, um, we know that the, the boundary data that was that can be used in the channel has problems of representing waves coming from the east. Um, and there are plenty of conditions where waves come from the east through the channel, but the boundary data generated there tends not to represent those cases very well. So we know that a lot of those conditions aren't well represented in the model. Um, whereas the machine learning model has, has seen enough of those cases that it, it can know how the, that representation looks. So we see this improvement actually compared to the hindcast, which is is very promising. Um, when we look specifically sort of now at the forecasting, so this is on the North Coast site. Um, so here in the tables here, so the the UKMO is the the model trained on the UKMO hindcast and SWAN is the model trained on the SWAN hindcast. And then on the plots, you see the, the UKMO trained model on the left, the SWAN model trained on the right, and then the wave boy measurement. So that's the ground truth shown in the red. Um, and all these statistics uh, or these RMSEs are, are against the ground truth. So that's the, what's measured by the wave boy. Um, and we see quite similar errors depending on the, the two models. Um, so it, there's some, there's not a huge dependency on the, the model, which is interesting considering they had some difference in the, the resolution that those hindcasts were run. Um, and then the sort of the, the uncertainty here is just sort of the forecast uncertainty over depending on the, the horizon. Uh, so again, not unsurprisingly, the that error increases as you go out to 12 hours compared to the now cast. Looking at the south coast, 
uh, we see slightly different results um, because of that that fact that I said where the, the boundary data doesn't represent a lot of the East Coast. Um, and so the SWAN model in particular uh, suffered from that, uh, whereas the, the Met Office model doesn't, given that it's, it's sort of a larger scale model. Uh, but again, we see very similar results between uh, the two trained models. So if we look at some storm events, oh, sorry, I don't want too fast. Um, if we look at some storm events here, so in particular here um, in 2016, February, um, you'll notice that the, the observation is quite high. Uh, so the Met Office here model refers to the Met Office's operational forecast. So that's a physics-based forecast. Um, and you see that that actually captures so this peak, for example, quite well, whereas the uh, the machine learning models seems to smooth a lot of that peak. You see sort of similar tendencies in, in most of the peaks. Um, so th this method tends to miss out some of those large scale events or larger events. But if I go back to sort of the point of context that I, I mentioned earlier, so the reason that we started looking at building these models was to sort of assist the offshore wind farm sector in particular, and they're interested not in these, these massive events, right? Because if you have a wave height limit of one meter, none of that's workable time. So that doesn't actually matter if it's, one, once it's above one and a half meters or whatever you're, your limit is, then th then it doesn't really matter. So if we look specifically at windows here, um, and so here, what you're seeing is the, the significant wave height plotted. Um, and then you've got in green uh, points, which are workable. Um, and then in red, these are false alarms. So times where your model thinks that you could work, but you actually can't. Um, is that right? No, sorry. You've got the false alarms are times when you, let me see if I get this right. Yeah, where you should have been able to work, uh, but your model couldn't, and then it's the reverse for the misses. So the, the point here is that the, we look just purely at windows. So we define windows in this case as periods of time where the significant wave height was below one and a half meters and you had a duration of at least four hours, which is pretty typical for getting someone onto a turbine, letting them do their work, and then getting them off. Uh, we see that the, the now cast for the physics-based model had, a, had an accuracy of 91%. The machine learning had slightly lower. And then we see all of these values sort of decrease the further out you're looking ahead. Um, the values which are sort of damaging are the false windows. So these are times when you attempted to, or you thought you could go to site, so you would schedule a vessel, incur the cost for the vessel, uh, but you actually wouldn't have been able to make it to the site. And what's interesting, or what I find interesting here, um, is that the, the machine learning model seems to have far fewer of those periods of times. So these are periods of times where you would attribute a lot of sign or a lot of additional cost. So there, there's potential here to save money. And this is quite new work, so I don't entirely understand why this is the case, or if this is purely a result of the, the one location that we've looked at. Um, so there's definitely more uh, to be done in this. But from, from that sort of operator perspective of sort of go, no go, the, it does seem that this machine learning based approach using local data that's more readily available um, does have merit. So that was all for the, the Southwest approaches, which is a relatively small site, well-contained. Um, and so we thought, well, given how rapid this approach is and how accurate we've seen it for this one site, can we actually deploy it elsewhere? Or is this all very niche and only applicable to the Southwest approaches? So we we took it to, to sort of expand that to the, the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and for a sense of scale here, so this gray box here represents the size of the, the domain we were looking at previously. So this area here, so the Gulf of Mexico is roughly about between 30 and 35 times larger. Um, whereas the Southwest approaches, we looked at water depths between say, or up to say about 80 or 90 meters. You've got regions 
here that are sort of several thousand meters. Uh, you've got far more complex oceanographic features going on. Um, and then you also have not just a much larger area, but you also have much sparser uh, sort of wave boys. Uh, though there are lots of wave boys here, you see sort of these two boys are roughly on opposite sides of, of this gray box, if you sort of look at that area. So the data is much further apart. Uh, we also had issues where there's very little concurrent data from these wave boys because of how they were set up and how they were deployed. Um, so this is really sort of taking the, the same system to, to the next limit the next level and sort of a, a higher scale of, of scale. Uh, so this one, we, we trained it on two years of, of Hindcast data uh, from the, the Met Office's global model this time. Um, and then we used two years of concurrent boy measurements um, to train the, the temporal model. And so here you've got some, you've got the results. So what you're seeing here is in this column is the Hindcast. In this column is the machine learning model, and then here is the difference. And then you've got the now cast at the top, uh, six hours ahead in the middle, and 12 hours ahead at the bottom. Um, and I, I recognize that these scales might be somewhat small, but so this is just looking at significant wave height. And you see that sort of in the, the areas here we're interested in, sort of um, this blue point here, um, we've got relatively low significant wave height errors, so less than half a meter, really. Um, and, and the areas where you start seeing quite a lot of difference, um, is closer to sort of the edges of the domain or those, those regions, which are significantly different from what your model had, uh, had seen in terms of the, the, the boy locations. Um, I think if there's anything else I need to say on this, but yeah, and, and sort of similar to what we'd seen previously, the, the errors increase depending on how far ahead you're looking, which isn't, again, that unsurprising. Um, if we look at a time series plot, so this is at that, that blue point that we use for validation. Um, so the, the machine learning model is shown in, in black. Uh, the hindcast model is the solid blue line. And then this dotted blue line is uh, what was observed by the wave boy. Um, and again, this is useful for, for sort of planning offshore work. So Gulf of Mexico, there's quite a lot of drilling operations as well as crew transfer going on there. So it, it, it's useful. Um, and we're working at the moment to sort of look if we can extend this to look at the, the, the loop current and the loop current eddy dynamics that, that are there in the, the Gulf as well. So rather than training on a wave hindcast model training on a circulation model. And then the final thing I'm going to talk about is sort of incorporating vessel measurements. So everything I've shown you so far, we've looked purely at, at using wave boys, which are established um, met boys for the most part. Uh, they've been around for, for 30, 40 years collecting data. They use quite traditional approaches. They're relatively small spherical objects that have quite well understood behavior. Um, so a question that we had is that can can you incorporate uh, vessel motions as a way of extrapolating what's happening at that location? And then can you use that in the same framework? And does that add any value? Um, so we simulated uh, a research vessel um, and sort of we ran it through a number of different uh, sea states at uh, a set location and then tried to see if we could incorporate that. Um, so to start with, we just sort of, we just simulated the vessel behavior um, and validated that against the boy at the same uh, conditions. So here the black markers show the, the boy data. Uh, and then the blue markers show sort of an ensemble average of the, the ship estimate of each of these. Um, and we sort of filtered out a few things where there was some, some clear errors. What, so sort of wave heights above 15 meters or uh, undefined sort of long periods uh, were sort of removed from the analysis uh, just because those were clear errors. And the, the thing is that for a ship acting as a wave boy, you end up with this, this filtering approach almost where if the wavelength, uh, depending on the wavelength, the, the ship won't be able to see the certain features of the wave, principally is anything shorter than the length of the ship 
it won't be able to perceive sort of a long beam. And then anything that's coming uh, night at 90 degrees to that um, will then also be filtered in a different way. Uh, for all of this, we assume that the vessel was stationary, so there's no forward speed on the vessel, um, but that's sort of the next step. So in this case, we, we went back to the Southwest approaches um, and then what we did is we we looked at a model where we had so the Perinport Louvre, uh, sorry Perinport, no, we had Penzance and Lou as inputs, um, and then validated a Perinport Port Levin and, and Fab test, and then we looked at adding in the Waveboy at or at WaveHub, uh, so simulating the vessel at WaveHub and including that, so. The main thing here is that in the original model, we only have information on uh, on the south coast. And then its question is, how much does adding information on the north coast improve um, sort of throughout the domain? Um, and I won't go into too much detail on all of this, uh, but there's a nice paper that describes all of this. Uh, the interesting thing is, or not unsurprising, I guess, is that the vessel including the, the ship on the North Coast improves the now casting accuracy as well as the forecasting accuracy at all um, at all time horizons. It's not quite as good as having a wave boy at that location, uh, which I suppose isn't unsurprising because your your vessel is effectively an imperfect wave boy, um, but it does make a, an improvement. Um, and so that does sort of open up the capacity for sort of every ocean going vessel to potentially be an observer in your network. Um, and that's where we're, we're probably taking this next. So to quickly sort of sum things up, we've presented a, a brief machine learning framework that can use in situ boy observations and a surrogate uh, regional model to, to forecast. Um, and the, the useful thing is that we sort of, we remove this reliance on boundary data and can overcome some of the errors that you you see from the boundary data. Uh, we tend to have similar levels of accuracy with physics-based forecasting models, but um, as with most machine learning models, we take the advantage of using a fraction of the computational requirements. Um, sort of next areas that we're looking at is sort of how can we incorporate mobile measurements, be that either drifting buoys, vessels, satellite tracks, um, how can we extend beyond? So right now, we've been looking at integrated parameters of waves, but what's also of value is actually looking at the full 2D spectra. Um, and then can we also incorporate sort of the, the NWP forecasts as, as an input to the system and use it for some sort of bias correction? Um, and yeah, with sort of ongoing things as well as we're working with Sort of some industrial case studies, so working with vessel operators to see if they can use this to actually operationalize some of their decision making, um, and and yeah, increasingly now offshore wind farms are using sort of resident autonomous vessels. Uh, so th these are vessels that are up to say about three or five meters. That that it's being proposed that they're permanently deployed at a wind farm site. So then that gives you another opportunity for collecting data. Um, so we're looking at ways to incorporate that and also to advise how those should actually be used within the site to best inform your um, your, your wave information. But yeah, uh, that was all I had. So thanks everyone. Thank you very much. Any questions in the room at all? Oh, yes, hands going up. Yeah. I'm curious how the um, that gap filling process that you mentioned works. I'll just get the microphone for you so yeah. people online can hear. Hi, I'm, I'm curious how the, you mentioned this gap filling process, and this yeah. seemed to be kind of the way that the hindcast information was provided to the machine learning model, or the the reason the, the way that information kind of gets fed into it. I'm yeah, curious how that gap filling works. So there's two different, well, so there's a gap filling that happens with the observations that might have gaps. Is that what you meant? Um, perhaps that's part of my question. Uh, yeah, maybe I didn't understand, but um, yeah, I, I guess you've, you've got this information about the kind of spatial temporal correlations that's coming from this hindcast model that you're using to kind of fill in the gaps between your observations. Yeah, so the, the, 
the hindcast model is used just to learn the spatial correlations right. um and then that um so you use the if i go back to a map yeah so in this case for example we'll use the hindcast uh throughout sort of this this domain and then we'll use the node points closest to these red dots as input and then the the wave conditions and throughout the rest of the domain as output for during training and then in operation we'll we'll substitute the the measured data from the boys as input. Okay, yeah. I, that's not sure I understand, but maybe I can find you afterwards. Yeah, and then we we do gap fill because for the temporal side of things, we we use a look back period of uh, I think it's forty eight time steps. Uh, so that needs to be contiguous across all of the boys um, in order for that to work, and that that's done using a, a low rank tensor completion approach. Oh, I see. So maybe the gap filling was just a temporal thing that I... Yeah, so the gap filling. So, it, yeah, and that's one of the issues we've had, especially in this domain, is because the low rank tensor completion that we use and work quite efficiently in the, the Southwest approaches sort of works well when the, the gaps are sparse. Um, but here, because of the data availability, we had quite large gaps. Uh, so we found that it didn't work quite as effectively. Um, so we ended up just using a, a shorter time period where we had, we had fewer gaps. Uh, nice. Hopefully that sort of gets is clearer. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm still, in my just the terminology, I'm not uh, as aware of the person, but like, what do you, what do you say hindcast data is fed into the model uh, prediction time? What do you, what does that look like at prediction time? Like hindcast to me implies like it's kind of historical data. Right? Yes. Yeah, so the hindcast is only used in training. Oh, it's only used in training. It's only okay. used in training. Yeah. So, so when we're so running you're only the, using the hind cast at the locations of the boys and you're feeding that in at training time well so we use it without throughout the whole domain of, okay but then in then what do you do at inference time or prediction time when you don't have it through the whole domain so um so yeah yeah so sorry yes the hind cast is used at the boy locations to train um right. and then in inference it's only the the boy data itself that's used I see. Okay. Yeah. So you, there's not really a sense in which you're filling in gaps spatially. It's just uh, temporary. Well, so the, or the, the your model's learning to do that. Yeah, the model's learning um, from these points in the hindcast what's happening in the rest of the domain in the hindcast. So the rest of the hindcast is still is is the output. Oh, I see. So you're asking it to predict. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Got it. Sorry. Yeah. No, I I struggle to explain how our model works. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, have you considered uh, how you could maybe incorporate uncertainty in your predictions? For example, like you you do one time series forecast, but you could do many, and then have an idea of uncertainty. Yeah, it's definitely something that could be done, and we we we've looked a little bit, or we've talked a little bit about doing that, um, because sort of depending on what your source of your observation is, you have some information about what the uncertainty is on that. So you could propagate that through in some way. Um, I haven't, or we haven't quite come up with what the best way of doing that would be, but it's definitely something that's that's on our minds. And you say when you make the predictions in time, you're just using the boy information, but you don't have that in the future. So is it just like a auto regression in time? Is that what you're doing? Because yeah, so the 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 temporal model predicts what's happening at the boy locations um, going forward forty eight hours or yeah forty eight hours. But you could so you but maybe that's what you said was future work, but you could use the forecast data it, itself, right? So you, in the there is going to be a forecast of the weather. Yeah. In the future, you could use that in your predictions of the waves alongside the machine, like. Yeah. So that's something we're we're looking at is sort of incorporating the the physics based forecasts as an input as well. Yeah, so like almost like bias correct yeah. the, the, the forecast. Yeah, and we have we've also run just the spatial model. I didn't show that here, but we've run the spatial model just using physics based forecasts as um as inputs. So say you've you've purchased just your your physics based forecast output at two or three points, you can then use that to then extrapolate what's happening spatially. Yes. Yeah, 
think that's all the questions. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Lovely. And then now over to our final presentation of the day. Um, it's Matthew Wilson um, at Google DeepMind. Um, comes from a hybrid background in mathematics, software engineering, statistics, and machine learning, and has been working on applications of machine learning uh, to weather for over, uh, well, around five years. So over to Matthew. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here. Um, so I'm here to talk about um, some of the weather models we've developed at uh, Google, and Google DeepMind in particular. Um, so yeah, we have a few different weather models at Google. Um, so the main ones are MetNet3, which is a now casting kind of now casting model that operates at quite fine spatial and temporal resolution. And then we have GraphCast and GenCast that were developed by the group that I'm part of in London. And these are more like medium range forecasting models uh, graphcast a deterministic model and gencast an ensemble model and then we also have neural gcm that was developed in the us and this is a, a, a very neat model that's um kind of a traditional general circulation model but with the parameterization schemes kind of ripped out and replaced by ml and um this can run at, this is also can run in deterministic or ensemble mode and at different different resolutions and can roll out to, to kind of weeks or decades even uh, but yeah, I'm going to focus in this talk on GraphCast and GenCast. Um, I'm assuming most of you are probably reasonably familiar with GraphCast. It's been mentioned in some of the previous talks. So I'll probably skip through that fairly quickly, but do slow me down if, if you want a bit more on, on GraphCast. Um, and I'll get on to GenCast, which is our more recent work. Um, so yeah, GraphCast uh, developed by the following lovely people that I'm speaking on behalf of. And uh, yeah, the goal was to improve global weather forecasting with machine learning. Uh, the GraphCast model, it runs up to 10 days ahead, uh, 0.25 degree resolution. And uh, like like Matt Chantry mentioned, you know, this this model and a bunch of other models like it did do seem to have brought about quite a paradigm shift in in forecasting, which is really cool to see. Um, we, we went, you know, at the, the time Matt mentions, you know, there was still a lot of uncertainty about whether this stuff would work. And we weren't sure either we were, almost skeptics ourselves some of us and managed to get it working and um, yeah really exciting times and yeah graphcast it, it outperforms the, the kind of gold standard hres the gold standard deterministic forecast at least and you know we've seen better cyclone predictions from it and um, it's obviously a lot faster to make forecasts from like uh, in matt's mouse versus elephant ant versus elephant um, chart um, so how does GraphCast work? It's a learned simulator based on graph neural networks. I probably don't have time to fully introduce graph neural networks, but I can give a, a rough idea. So it takes as input a weather state, which is given on a, a latitude longitude grid at I think 37 vertical levels. Um, uh, it then maps it then maps that to a next state. And to kind of zoom in a bit on that, how does that work? So there's three components, the encoder, um, yeah. The encoder, which um, maps the weather state on the Latlon grid to a, uh, an icosahedral mesh, um, a kind of a latent state on this mesh. And then we have a bunch of rounds of message passing on that mesh. Um, and then it's mapped back after at the end, um, it's decoded back onto the original Latlon grid. Um, so when I mentioned the mesh, we actually, for GraphCast, we actually used what we called a multi mesh, which consists of the kind of union of, of all the edges from all these iterative refinements of the icosahedral mesh. So we have edges of different lengths that can kind of pass information at different length scales. And yeah, and then, you know, this whole process is then repeated iteratively to roll out the forecast. Um, you know, each step is six hours and we, we go up to 10 days. You can go more than 10 days, but you know, it's, it, it, it does get a bit worse and eventually, yeah, we didn't push it a lot beyond 10 days. And this is trained, um, like Matt mentioned, um, I think AIFS sounds like it works similarly, but um, this is trained uh, based on rollout. So we roll out the model iteratively to generate a sequence and we back propagate a loss that penalizes errors over the entire sequence. Um, yeah, and there's a kind of a schedule. Oh, sorry, I, I think I'm one slide ahead of the, of the screen, sorry. Um, yeah, and so th there's a schedule for this. So we start out training just on a single time step. And then towards the end of training, we kind of ramp it up. So this this kind of purple ladder here. 
Um, so we start generating longer and longer sequences all the way up to 12 steps, which is three days. Uh, it does get a bit more expensive towards the end of training. This is a somewhat expensive process. I think there's been some other papers that have come out since finding slightly cheaper ways to do similar things, but ultimately it, did, it does seem important for GraphCast to be able to train in a way that penalizes error at longer lead times. So I'll, I'll talk more about that later. And yeah, how does it do? Um, so on the top row, we have sort of absolute skill um, in terms of RMSE. Uh, blue is GraphCast and black is HRES. And then on the... Oh yeah. I, I think there's maybe something up with this. That seems to be slide behind quite a bit. Um, sorry. Yeah, so the top row we've got... Um, yeah, the comparison of the kind of absolute RMSE skills and the bottom row is the relative RMSE. And yeah, we can see that GraphCast is doing better than HRES almost everywhere. There's some exceptions like, you know, to here 2T at short lead times, we're doing a little bit worse. Um, just as a side note, it's nice to do confidence intervals on these kind of plots when you can. Um, and yeah, we've also, we've also generated scorecards, so ECMWF style scorecards um, where which which kind of show here a red entry on the scorecard means HRED is doing better and a blue uh, square means uh, GraphCast is doing better. And if you kind of zoom in on one row of the scorecard, that kind of corresponds to this relative skill score plot. It's just a nice visual way to summarize you know, over all variables. And I think these are nice to look at and nice to show. Um, yeah, and yeah, you can see here the main weakness of GraphCast is um, at 50 hectopascals, kind of way up in the stratosphere we're not doing so well uh, we've since actually managed to get better results there but you know the published model doesn't do so well there um yeah and we've tried applying it to <laughs> cyclone tracking and also as was mentioned in matt's talk yeah we, we get better results than than hres um you know cyclones there's only so many cyclones in our evaluation year and so that's why these confidence intervals are slightly wide definitely important um to to Compute those confidence intervals, I think. Um, ideally, yeah, we'll use more evaluation years as well. But yeah, we seem to gain around nine hours of accuracy over the published HRES tracks. And, you know, you can do some case studies. You can look at like Cyclone Lee, um, where we managed to predict uh, where it was going to make landfall nine days ahead. And I think the um, NWP models were only predicting it about six six days ahead. I mean, of course, you know, it's just one example, you know, maybe the other where we did worse, but, you know, just to, just to accompany the overall analysis there. Uh, but yeah, let me move on to GenCast. Um, so GenCast is a diffusion-based ensemble forecasting model, also for medium range weather, and develops with the following people. And, you know, a big part of the motivation was, you know, a big criticism of a lot of these machine learning weather models is that they're only giving deterministic predictions, right? And they're gonna they, they they tend to blur at long lead times. They don't give you any kind of uncertainties. They don't tell you anything about the tails of the distribution. And the solution, at least a solution that uh, you know, uh, is ensemble forecasting. I'm sure all of you know this already, but just to just to sort of recap, as I see it, you know, the goal here is to try and model the joint distribution of weather over space and time, uh, at least to sort of implicitly model it in the in the form of like being able to draw samples from that joint distribution. And yeah, so we can sample multiple trajectories. Um, you know, in the case of NWPs, this would be done by perturbing the, the, the physical model, either its initial conditions or maybe the, the parameters of the model itself. Um, and then you use this ensemble to estimate, you know, whatever expectations or probabilities you want using the Monte Carlo method. And so, you know, it was a quite obvious question, can we do this with machine learning? So there's this whole field of generative modeling and machine learning, which is aiming to do exactly this kind of thing. I'm drawing samples from high dimensional joint distributions. And, uh, you know, here we have in the top row, we've got um, some samples from a model developed at Google that um, generates images. I'm sure a lot of you have seen these AI generated images and videos. So this is a text conditional model. Um, in our case with weather, we want to condition not on some text prompt, but on previous weather states. And we want to predict the next state, but otherwise it's actually quite a, quite a similar approach. Um, and you can kind of see in this this animation here that um, the way diffusion works is it iteratively transforms noise into a sample from the distribution of interest. 
Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll do a little bit of a, a quick introduction to diffusion models. I may have to hand wave a bit about the maths here, but hopefully there's some references in the slides, I think, if anyone's interested to follow up. Um, but yeah, so the idea of diffusion models is, let's say you've got a, a joint distribution over images of dogs. Um, it's quite, you can imagine kind of transforming this distribution into, the, into a distribution over pure noise just by incrementally adding more and more IID Gaussian noise to your image until eventually you've added so much noise that all the signals are effectively gone. And you can model this using a stochastic differential equation and quite a simple stochastic differential equation where you're just adding in noise. Um, but the, the nice trick is that with stochastic differential equations, you can kind of reverse them and do the opposite. So transform your noise distribution back into the data distribution. And the, the key, I won't go too much into the details here, but the key object that you need to do this is this thing called the score function. So the, the kind of the gradient of the log probability of the, the the not the original data but the kind of the data after the noise has been added let's say at a given noise level um and then the second kind of key trick is that you can estimate this score function by training a denoiser model um and what does that mean so a denoiser would be let's say a neural network that you give it as input a version of the data that's been corrupted by noise and you kind of task it with predicting the original data and as it's trained just using mean squared error, it's going to learn to give you something like a conditional expectation of the original data, given the noisy data, and also conditioning on whatever prompt or input, what any kind of prompt you want to give it. And in our case, that prompt will be like previous weather states. Um, so yeah, you can you can learn to approximate this score function by training a denoiser. It's very convenient because the denoiser is trained with mean squared error, so you can use essentially the same approach you use to train a deterministic weather model, ML weather model. You just train it with mean squared error. The difference is that instead of just asking it to predict the next states, um, just conditional on the previous states, you're kind of giving it a hint. You're saying, here's a noisy version of the next state. Now see if you can denoise it. Um, and then, but then what do you actually do with this network once you've trained it? Because it's not, you can't just directly generate predictions from it. What you do is you plug it into an SDE solver that solves this equation, this reverse equation. Well, in fact, you tend to solve something called the probability flow ODE, which is a little bit more straightforward. Um, and that this solving this process of running the solver requires multiple steps. So this is an aspect in which these models are more expensive than a deterministic model. You might need, say, we used forty kind of forty function evaluations of the trained denoiser, which makes it maybe forty times more expensive than a comparable deterministic model. Um, there are ways around. There are ways to speed this up, but um, maybe discuss later. Yeah, so at a high level, how does it work? Um, again, it's it's the model's kind of applied autoregressively. Um, so you run it one step at a time. We we use 12 hour steps here. Um, and this model runs just at one degree latitude longitude resolution. Like Matt mentioned, you can get surprisingly good results even at one degree resolution. Um, and because this model's a little bit more expensive, it, it just made it a bit easier, a bit faster for us to iterate the research if we took the resolution down a notch for now. It should scale up to higher resolution, and we're we're kind of pushing that now. But um, the the kind of the work that we published was one degree, and we're predicting, uh, I think, at thirteen vertical levels rather than thirty seven, and and so on. So it's scaled down slightly from Graphcast, um, but still good results. And um, yeah, and we roll it out to to fifteen days at the moment. It can go for longer, without blowing up horribly. Um, that's still an area we're exploring. And yeah, at each step, you can kind of see in this diagram, you know, you, 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 you're you iteratively transforming some noise. I don't know if I can point it here, but yeah, you've got some sort of noise that you're transforming step by step using the solver of the reverse diffusion to take you down to your a kind of a, a delta against your previous step that you add on to your previous step, and that gives you your next weather state, and then kind of rinse and repeat. Um, yeah, for de the details of the diffusion, um, it's actually followed quite a standard approach. I'd recommend this this Karas et al. paper that provides a really nice kind of way of thinking about these diffusion models. We followed their kind of framework. Um, there's some slight differences in the way we sample noise is a bit tailored to the spherical geometry. We sample it to have a flat power spectrum in the spherical harmonic domain instead of a just sampling IID noise on the grid, which is the kind of naive thing, which actually gives you a kind of not very flat power spectrum. Uh, it's not critical, but it does seem to improve things a little bit. Um, 
And then for the denoise architecture, it's actually very similar to GraphCast. The only difference is we're using a spatial, um, we're using a, what's it called? Like a sparse attention kind of graph attention approach for the processor, which is slightly different to the graph neural network approach we had before. We don't have the multi-mesh edges in there now. Um, honestly, the specific architecture probably isn't that critical to it. This was just faster for us. We, we came up with some clever optimizations to speed this up. And honestly, that's the main reason it's different. Um, yeah. And if we visualize some, some samples from the model um, here, I think we've got one particular example uh, predicting uh, humidity at 700 hectopascals. I think we picked that one to show because it's kind of quite a detailed variable with a lot of high resolution content that a deterministic model is going to blur out. Um, and you can see we've got, you know, this was the error five analysis for the, the, the target that we're trying to predict. Here are three samples from the model predicted from 12 hours earlier. And then here's three samples predicted 10 days earlier. And you can see you've got sort of quite detailed detailed predictions but with a suitable amount of sort of variation between them especially when you're predicting 10 days ahead and this is kind of what we want to see we want to see realistic predictions or at least reasonably realistic looking predictions that don't just blur out so obviously if you know take an ensemble mean it's going to look blurry and then when you look at the predictions from a deterministic model like graph class they're, they're interesting they're kind of somewhere in between they're not as blurry as an ensemble mean would be but they're clearly a lot more blurry than the ground truth over here and the, the predictions from the diffusion model. So yeah, how do we evaluate these models? Um, this one, if anyone has any better ideas, please reach out because it's like a perennial source of, you know, questions in, in terms of like, how do we, as machine learning people, how do we evaluate these models? What, what metrics should we be using? Um, we certainly look at skill scores like the continuous, like CRPS. Um, ensemble mean RMSE, and Briar scores for particular events of interest, like exceeding certain percentiles of climatological distributions and things. But most of these scores are just evaluating like the marginal, essentially the marginal predictive distributions from the model. And we really wanted to kind of assess how well we're modeling the joint distribution as well. And that's quite difficult to capture. I mean, in a sense, if you can solve that problem, you've solved the whole problem of generative modeling. So, you know, there's all sorts of different approaches to it, like GANs and things that try to learn, a, almost like learn the metric that you use to assess that. But um, one thing that we looked at that's that's relevant, but doesn't give you the whole picture is the power spectra, spherical harmonic power spectrum. So if, if we're blurring our predictions a lot, it's gonna show up in the power spectrum. Um, we looked at things like predicting derived variables. So if you're modeling the joint distribution well, you should be able to kind of compute any derived variable that you want and, be, and model that reasonably well as well. Whereas with a deterministic model, there's some, some weird things that happen there sometimes with derived variables. And then we also looked at reliabilities. So this is really important. Um, so Matt, what you touched on, like this kind of spread skill ratio and making sure that spread and skill are kind of commensurate so that um, you're not you're not kind of over dispersed or under dispersed. And then you can look at rank histograms as well. Uh, but firstly, just to look at the skill of the model, um, it's doing better. So here we're comparing GenCast against ENS, both using 50 ensemble members. Uh, so blue, again, blue means that GenCast is doing better and red means that ENS is doing better. And the upshot of it is we're better almost everywhere, but not so great at short lead times and higher up in the atmosphere. And I think maybe there's you know one or two other patches of red there, but... Uh, better on, I think, 90, 96% of these targets on, on CRPS, this is. Um, so for physical plausibility, yeah, to look at the power spectra, we can see, so here, blue is gen cast, and the, the dotted line is the power spectra of the ERA-5 targets that it was trained on, which you'd reasonably expect it to sort of match. This is just like the average power spectrum over all the predictions that we made. And... Yeah, so we managed to match that quite closely. Um, there's maybe some mild discrepancies, but generally not too bad. But what's interesting for comparison is the pink line, which is what we get, predictions you get from GraphCast if you perturb its initial conditions. And this, you, you know, with GraphCast, you can clearly see that we're blurring. It's blurring a lot. At um, you know, the high frequency content is dropping out here. And um, 
yeah, that's something that these diffusion models generally avoid doing. If anything, sometimes you have the opposite problem where there's actually a little bit of high frequency noise that gets left in there that shouldn't be there. Um, but it's generally not too bad. You can maybe see it, a hint of it here, maybe a little bit of extra high frequency noise. And then with derived variables, we looked at, so one, one thing that people noticed about Graphcast is its wind speed predictions are actually quite rubbish because if you, essentially due to this fact here, you know, it's trained to predict the expectation of this UV wind vector. Um, but the, the the kind of the magnitude of that expectation is not the same as the expectation of the magnitude. And so you tend to find this bias, this negative bias in wind speed from the graph cast predictions. Um, and this is something that goes away with, with GenCast because it's modeling the joint distribution over the U and V wind. It's modeling the correlations between the U and V. Therefore, it can get the wind speed right as well without having to be trained sort of fine tuned specifically to do that. That's just a nice little thing. You know, there's other examples you can do and other kind of derived variables and you get a, a similar kind of story. Um, yeah, and to look at reliability and spread. So the spread skill score is, or spread skill ratio is one thing we looked at. So this is sort of essentially the same idea as Matt's plots where he was plotting the spread and the skill separately. Um, this is just the ratio of the two and you expect it to be around one. Um, and that, you know, for a, for a perfectly calibrated forecast, it would be one. Um, yeah, and you can see GenCast, we're very, actually, we've got very good kind of calib sort of calibration there or reliability there, at least at longer lead times. Uh, ENS is pretty good too. And then GraphCast, the perturbed version of GraphCast is very under dispersed, which is similar to what happened with AI, AIFS, it seems. Um, yeah, um, this over dispersion at short lead times, by the way, I would, the one the technical issue here is we're evaluating all these models against deterministic analysis. And that will tend to make, if you imagine what happens at lead time zero, like pretty much any dispersion in your initial conditions, it's going to look over dispersed relative to a deterministic analysis. So. I kind of take with a pinch of salt anything about dispersion at very short lead times here. Um, yeah, and then if we uh, if we look and so this this plot at twelve hours for that reason I'd probably take that with a pinch of salt as well to be honest. But um, the rank when you look at the rank histograms at three days and fifteen days, so here this is kind of like the rank of the ground truth value in the sorted order of the, the forecast from all the ensembles, and with a perfect forecast, you'd expect this to be completely flat. Um, it's essentially the, the same idea as the probability integral transform. The idea is you get a kind of uniform distribution out at the end in the ideal case. And GraphCast, you get a very flat um, <laughs> rank histogram, which is nice to see. The GraphCast perturbed is very um, under dispersed. And then, then ENS suffers some issues on these rank histograms as well that um, Graph cast, that GenCast avoids at least at three days. Um, so yeah, this model seems to work surprisingly well. Um, uh, one reason for this we think is that the fact that it's generating realistic samples just makes the whole autoregressive feedback mechanism work better for ML models. So with GraphCast, I guess how it would work would be, you know, GraphCast predicts something like a predictive mean um, and that predictive mean then gets is is inherently going to be slightly blurry. If there's some location uncertainty about where the weather's going, a predictive mean is just going to have to blur it out. And when we then take that slightly blurry predictive mean and feed it back into GraphCast, it's kind of got to learn how to take as input these blurry states that it might not have seen at training unless you do some kind of autoregressive training. And you know, it's a kind of a slightly slightly weird learning problem when you really think about what you're asking it to do. And this is why we've we think is why we've seen that multi-step training is important, but it kind of comes at a slight cost. You know, when you when you train one of these deterministic models like GraphCast um, to penalize error over a longer sequence, it helps RMSE at longer lead times, as you'd hope. But it comes at a little bit of a cost to RMSE at short lead times, and you know, maybe this is avoidable with a smarter approach. But it's still. Firstly, it's unfortunate that you have to do this long training because it's quite expensive. And, and secondly, there's just something a little bit unsatisfactory about this. So with GenCast, because it's by the nature of these diffusion models, they predict somewhat realistic samples. I don't want to say fully realistic. You know, there's always, you're probably going to be able to find some aspects in which they're not, but they're, they're generally a lot more realistic. And so we find that we only need to train it on a single time step. 
So we can train it just to predict 12 hours ahead. We can unroll it all the way to 15 days without training at all of 15 days. And it just seems to work, um, which is really actually quite surprising. It surprised me. I was expecting that we'd have to come up with some like tricks to find ways to train it on longer rollouts. And it turned out that wasn't necessary, which was lucky because it's quite hard. Uh, you know, with diffusion models, obviously you've got this expensive process where you, you you solve this reverse diffusion and there's like 40 steps in in that 40 steps of the solver that we apply and we don't really want to have to back propagate all through those 40 steps so it's quite nice that we didn't have to um so initially i thought this was surprising then one of my colleagues pointed out maybe actually the very reason why you know th this i this this reason because we're feeding the realistic samples back this could be just why this isn't necessary um so yeah that that was actually and when i talk to people this is often the thing that they're most surprised about or that they like about the work so just a, a nice takeaway i think that you can get away with training with only one time step with these models and then just to kind of end it out i guess a, a question is like are ensembles actually necessary when you're doing machine learning based forecasting i mean obviously i think they at least if not necessary that they're certainly useful otherwise i wouldn't have worked on it but there's still, I think, some debate going on in amongst ML folks, at least, about do we really need ensembles? You know, because when you think about it, ensembles are quite expensive. You've got to use the, you know, you know you've got to generate a lot of ensemble members to get these Monte Carlo estimates, and um, it's 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 expensive. And um, you can just train a machine learning model to directly predict joint distributions. You know, you might. Um, you know, just have your activations from your last layer. You might have like an output head on your network that predicts like either a mean or a variance. So I might predict a whole kind of categorical distribution uh, for any value, any kind of univariate quantity that you want to predict. And ultimately, I guess in weather, a lot of the time that what you ultimately care about is going to be some kind of univariate quantity, maybe not all the time, but generally there'll be something that you can define that you're going to be making your decisions based on. And, you know, the, the approach that some other groups have taken is like let's predict these things directly let's predict probabilities for them probability distributions and let's kind of cut the ensembles out of the game and turns out this works very well for now casting so if you've seen the metnet model this is essentially the approach they they take and there may there may well be a bunch of other applications where this is this works perfectly fine and you don't really need an ensemble um but i think you know ensembles do still have some really compelling advantages probably you don't need to sell these to meteorologists i know you guys are like used to using these and, and to the advantages of them but obviously an ensemble forecast because you're trying to model the full joint distribution is very general you can you can use it for any kind of downstream decision problem that you like subject to having big enough ensembles um and you don't need to kind of fine-tune the network for each problem that you want to apply it to which i think is very nice you know when people talk about foundation models in machine learning they're talking about some model that you can fine-tune for everything you want to use it for but in a sense you know, ensembles, ensemble forecast models like the the original um, foundation model and that you can use them for pretty much anything you want in principle, at least. Um, but secondly, I think there's a, a, an advantage that, again, maybe whether folks are kind of well aware of, but mm -hmm. as machine learning people, we're sort of just realize, some of us are maybe just realizing is it provides, for the, this autoregressive decomposition is a very valuable thing, I think. So you could train a, a model to directly predict marginal distributions for different quantities of interest about the weather at 10 day lead time, 15 day lead time. But this is very, really hard. Like in a sense, maybe the net, maybe you need to incorporate some prior knowledge that tells the network that, you know, the way you get to 15 day lead time is by iteratively applying the same kind of dynamics. And this is like a, a quite valuable kind of inductive bias to build into the model. And also the, you know, the Monte Carlo method that we use with ensembles, it lets us decompose this problem of predicting probabilities at a longer lead time into these manageable water regressive steps and as we've seen this can give us stable and skillful forecasts at you know at, at say 15 day lead times even if we're only training on a single step i think that's that's like an, a kind of a slightly hidden advantage of the on the ensemble forecasting method is that it allows us to take this big kind of scary problem of predicting i don't know a probability distribution for the location of a cyclone at 15 days time and break it down into these manageable steps in a way you're kind of solving a more general problem than you need to solve but that the fact you add that generality that the fact you add that generality then allows you to kind of decompose the problem in a nice way so i think ensembles are here to stay but we'll see the jury's maybe still out 
Um, and yeah, like I guess future directions for this work, we'd like to increase the resolution. Uh, we'd like to increase the ensemble size, you know, a big, whenever we talk about machine learning ensembles, people always say, oh yeah, you know, you can generate much larger ensembles. To me, I've been looking into this a little bit. I, I feel like when you look at there's papers on kind of relative economic value for larger ensembles, and it seems like the tasks where you really need a larger ensemble are maybe a little bit more specialized and we're still, I'm still trying to get a handle on that. So if anyone here knows of applications that really would benefit from large ensembles, definitely reach out. Um, but it's certainly an angle that we like to push and it's an angle that can be enabled by making these machine learning models nice and cheap to run. Uh, we'd like to fine tune it on operational analysis like we did for, for Graphcast. Um, we'd like to make the process of sampling cheaper. So like I said, it takes these 30 or 40 solver steps per iteration, right? Per kind of step right now. And um, there's methods for doing this that some people will distill these diffusion models into a model that maybe only requires one step or maybe a handful of steps instead of 40, 40 steps, let's, let's say. Um, and then something that comes up sometimes when I talk to people about ensembles is data assimilation. I guess data assimilation is one of the actual original big motivations for having ensembles at all. I mean, obviously they're useful for forecasts as well, but they're really useful for ensemble DA. So other ways that we can use these ML ensembles within the DA process. Um, these are interesting questions to me as well. And then, yeah, more broadly, we're also very interested in the, the idea of like directly using observations as well, like observation driven forecasting. That's a whole other kettle of fish. <laughs> um, yeah. So I guess in, in conclusion, um, yeah, deep learning has caused a, a, a paradigm shift in medium range weather forecasting. And um, we've developed a model graph cast that provides the best, well, maybe it's not the best anymore. I don't know. These models are constantly like, like you know, catching up with each other, but um, yeah, at the time it was the best deterministic operational model. We've actually got more improvements to it internally as well. Um, and it's useful for real world applications like cyclone tracking, very fast to generate predictions from. And we have a model GenCast, which outperforms the best operational ensemble system at one degree resolution on 96% of targets. And this only requires training on a single time step to give you skillful forecasts up to 15 days. Uh, so GraphCast is available on GitHub. Um, that's open sourced. And the forecast, as Matt mentioned, the forecast from it are live on ECMWF's website. Slightly embarrassing that we've not got them live on a Google website, to be honest, uh, that ECMWF had them up there first, but we're working on that as well. Um, it's very cool um, to see them there. And um, yeah, we've got the links to the papers here and the codes and the GenCast paper. And I know the question is going to be, are we going to open source GenCast? And the answer is we're working on it, hopefully not too long. Um, but watch this space. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Matthew, any questions in the room at all for Matthew? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that talk. Um, so strategically, how would you see the difference of, say, Google as opposed to a National Weather Centre and how it might be different, how the ability for you to make machine learning forecasts as opposed to a National Weather Centre? So is there some data that you might have access to that we don't or vice versa? Like, how do you see this playing out? Um, I mean, the strategic questions might be slightly above my pay grade, but I think... Um... You know, obviously we're de we're dependent on NWP reanalysis from folks like ECMWF at the moment. Um, there's more we can do in terms of direct directly making use of observations. When it comes to observations, yeah, you know, I think the weather agencies have an advantage there, and generally in what they have access to. There is still a lot that we do have access to, though. So I think there's still a lot we can do, but um, we'll kind of see how this plays out over the next few years. I think. Thanks. And there's one question online, if that's okay. okay. Are there any effect, any efforts to run graph casts directly from observations as opposed to the analysis step? Um, I'd say watch this space. Yeah, I think that there's definitely more that we can do there. Like an obvious thing is to kind of do some kind of post-processing and you know, rather than train a model like graph cast and then do some post-processing to it afterwards, you can kind of train something end-to-end -end that's, that's learning to target observations at specific ground sites or whatever. 
and that's that's like one first step there um, it's definitely something we're interested in and you know we could go a lot beyond that as well i mean ultimately i guess graphcast it's still a little bit more suited to taking kind of gridded reanalyses as input let's say so to completely if we were to completely try and do away with reanalysis we'd probably have to reconsider a lot more about graphcast but i think there's certainly even even continue you know if we continue to rely on reanalysis there's still a lot more that we can do to incorporate observations directly into it as well Brilliant. Oh, sorry. One more question. Uh, thanks, Matt. What do you think is happening at short lead times higher up in the atmosphere with GenCast? Sort of because it's the 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 negative scores. They're only short, but they're quite a lot lower than what happened in GraphCast. So, you do have an understanding of what's going on. Um, to be honest, we've not really looked into this in detail. If any any kind of meteorologists have any ideas about this, I'd be interested to discuss. It might just be the weighting. Like we do weights um higher up in the atmosphere lower in our loss just because you know ultimately you care more about values close to the ground i'm not sure that's the entirety of it though um i think more investigation needed to be honest and the fact that we're doing worse at short lead times i think maybe because we in part because we're only using one degree we're only conditioning on one degree analysis and that's quite low resolution and there's some kind of detail that you might get from conditioning on higher resolution analysis that you might be important for performance at short lead times but still it's a bit puzzling why it's higher up in the atmosphere that we're doing worse yeah because i'd expect to see that at the surface actually yeah like yeah temperature if it was a resolution factor yeah yeah um yeah anyone has an idea any ideas about this let me know <laughs> basically So we've heard a lot about larger scale global modeling today. I just wondered, if regional modeling at much higher resolutions, such as the UK model that we use every day for convection, et cetera. Have you got any thoughts how that would go with machine learning? I'm sure people are thinking about that already. I mean, obviously we don't have an analysis, many years of analysis data equivalent that we can use. So have you got any thoughts about that? Um, yeah, I mean, it's not something we've looked into in detail ourselves, but it's certainly it feels like this should be something you could do here. Like you can certainly like a model like Graphcast, you could have like a local area refinement of the mesh over some area of interest. Let's say if you wanted to train kind of a combined local area model, global model. Um, but yeah, like you say, finding high resolution reanalysis might be a challenge. I know there's some kind of higher resolution reanalyses available, let's say over the US or over Japan or certain certain parts of the, the earth, maybe not as many years are available of it. That it might be that you could kind of find ways to pre-train a model at coarser resolution and then fine tune it at higher resolution. That is something that you can sort of do with GraphCast. It's not necessarily always faster than just training it from scratch at higher resolution, to be honest, but it is possible. And it might be that with some more work, you could kind of try and structure the graph neural network in a way that helps it to generalize across different resolutions. Um, but yeah, these are just ideas off the top of my head, really. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I guess one of the key points is that with this, you don't actually have to resolve things in the sense of, you know, physically resolving them. You're really just your output is just your mesh is defining your output sort of resolution, isn't it? So I guess that's an advantage straight away in principle. But... Yeah, yeah. I think that's the, like Matt said, you know, the big advantage of one big advantage of these ML models is that they can implicitly resolve all the subgrid scale stuff. And um, what's well, not even, to me, it's a little bit arbitrary. The fact that we happen to use a, a certain resolution of mesh internally, it's like it could easily be kind of representing a finer mesh. Even it could be, you could imagine it even explicitly representing a finer mesh using the kind of like 512 dimensional latent variables that it has at each grid point or whatever. So it's, it's it, the internal resolution is perhaps less relevant, I think. To me, what's maybe more important is like the resolution of analysis that it's initialized from and maybe you know if you're if you're predicting at specific ground site you know if you're you want to generate predictions at high resolution that take into account high resolution kind of orographic features and kind of local features of the locations you're trying to predict at you could imagine having a still a lower internal resolution but some kind of final post-processing step that maybe handles that okay thanks Great, thank you very much for that. And that is, uh, yeah, the end of uh, this afternoon. It's been uh, fantastic. Thank you 
to all the speakers. It's it's been sort of really really interesting, and and thank you to the Geological Society as well for for hosting. And um, yeah, we'll stop it there. Thank you very much.